Hello everyone, I'm Heidi Wang from DSC. I am in charge of the uh, daily operations and projects uh, at DSC. And together with me today, I have Nobu. So Nobu is our chair of DSC. And I want to ask you, Nobu, maybe you introduce yourself and uh, a little bit about DSC, uh, what is it about? My name is Nobu Ide. Uh, yes, I'm the uh, chairperson of the DSC. At the same time, I'm doing a CEO of Wacom Corporations. Uh, and I think looking back to six years ago, when we launched the DSC uh, in 2016, uh, I think our vision uh, has been very consistent you know, until today. So we, we're really trying to kind of uh, develop some uh, communities and platforms and are uh, for digital stationaries, not only just the digital IT you know, partners, but are, uh, anybody who are really interested in developing the new experience and meaningful experience for the about stationary, crossing over analog and digital. So not just for the building up the new marketplace, but are, uh, trying to build up the new experience uh, for the users and for communities. So I think that is a uh, original intent of DSC and I think we have been working for six years for these missions and uh, I really appreciate uh, the you know the various partners participants for this uh, platforms community DSC and uh, many many collaboration is going on and we also got uh, some our uh, you know technology innovations and also discussions how we are going to you know, uh, communicate with that, you know, the uh, market and communities. Yes, and uh, we are here today. Connecting what you're saying, Novo, I also um, want to share um, my experience also working with these partners. And I think DSC, uh, being, I'm also at Wacom and having a technology partnership with these partners. But with DSC, we really um, opened another platform and level of engagement. Uh, which is um, what I find most fascinating is um, it's very user driven and community driven. So we get together and um, we, we are engaging with partners from different domains, right? So we have tech companies, top notch yeah. um, tech um, brands, but at the same time we have um, stationary, so traditional stationary companies with very, very long heritage. We have users, we have researchers, and I think this is really a platform that allows very interactive um, exchange and also driving like uh, market um, development projects, uh, research, also capturing uh, voices of customers. Last six years, uh, it's, you know, uh, we are developing their communities platforms, not from like our, uh, the customers, suppliers, things, but all the participants and their collaborators are flat and equivalent perspectives and learning each other. I personally learned so much things, you know, mm -hmm. uh, from our uh, stationary people, for the long history guys, you know, so their passions and their expertise, uh, their, you know, their mindset and their craftsmanships, you know, uh, I personally learned so much, you know, uh, and I have, a, you know, their huge excitement, you know, mm -hmm. so we can learn more, we can learn each other's more and their I think we can develop uh, the meaningful experience for their yeah. end users in the yeah. end. Mm -hmm. Maybe one thing I just want to ask you to share a little bit, Noble. We are called the Digital Stationery um, Consortium, right? The word digital is um, our joint technology uh, development goal. But um, also during the interviews, um, we can hear also how um, the value of analog and the emotions and the history and heritage behind um, is also um, something that we don't, we cannot um, jeopardize. So what, what's your view on the, yeah. the coexistence of digital and analog? Yes, it's true. We titled DSC, Digital Stationary Consortium, uh, to highlight some more, you know, the digital aspect. But I think, I strongly believe in the end is just instrument it's just our you know equal instrument whether it's analog or digital it's an instrument for the human beings uh how you're going to create how you're going to support your learning study 
you know, how we are going to support some working, workflow, whatever. But anyhow, it's just instrument for the human beings. And they're uh, leveraging uh, from all aspects, including digital, analog, or hybrid. I think we are trying to develop a new experience. Uh, so in, in this sense, uh, even though we title digital, DSC, Digital Stationary Consortium, but our core spirit, our baseline, and our original starting point is how interesting, meaningful experience we can deliver through the instrument for the human beings. So that, that's how I'm, you know, perceiving and that's uh, how I'm trying to, you know, uh, have a consistent uh, the pillars inside of me when I'm working as a DSC members. And following, uh, we will also hear uh, from the partners how um, in the dialogue, they really also share how they see DSC's vision and how they bring in also their company vision um, to connect to the joint vision as DSC and how also they see the coexistence and where analog and digital stationery coming together in a meaningful way. So I'm super excited. Um, uh, to join uh, also these uh, dialogues and to hear the views. Let's enjoy the whole dialogue in all DSC sessions yeah. through, across our Connected Inc. event. Yeah, yeah. agree. <laughs> Hello, my name is Heidi, Heidi Wang. I work for Wacom. I'm here with Felix, a longtime partner uh, for Wacom. So Felix, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, hi Heidi. Nice to sit here in the call. I mean, uh, we already met a couple of times in person, so it's a very familiar situation that we're in. My name is Felix. I work for Mopo since eight years. I'm responsible for the new technologies department as a director. So um, the new technologies department is basically um, taking care of digitizing uh, products within Mopo. So these consist of digital writing instruments, these consist of smartwatches, headphones, um, so basically a broad portfolio that we do. Um, but today here, uh, we mainly focus on, on digital writing, which is basically also our uh, heritage uh, at Mont Blanc with a uh, history of over a hundred years. Uh, so this is really the roots of Mont Blanc. And as Heidi already mentioned, we're also part of the DSC, a founding member of DSC. And for us, it was always important to um, be also in a driver's seat when we talk about how to move into a stationary, a digital stationary uh, from our perspective, because we have a lot of learnings from our uh, more traditional writing that we also want to be reflected into this uh, digital writing. So to open up the discussion, so we at Wacom, um, as I shared, I'm in charge of the Ink Division. And I want today to talk a little bit um, about our partnership, how we came together. Um, I want to also share a little bit um, um, how our vision um, really think. But just let's start when we started everything at the beginning. Um, so what are memorable yes. moments from your view? I'm not sure if you can remember. This is actually my 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 first pitch, actually, that I also had at uh, one of the early Connected Inc. events um, where, where I presented. It was around uh, the Golden Triangle of Blanc basically is around uh, the ink, uh, is around the paper, so the surface where you write on. And it's about the writing instrument uh, or the pen that actually lets the ink flow on on, on your paper and um, the three parts to combine them in a perfect way actually will resemble the best writing feeling. And I know that we had a lot of discussions on how can we mimic that in a digital world? How can we work together uh, to make this perfect match in a, in a, digital, in a digital world? And it's, it is still an exciting journey because I think that there are still a lot of things uh, that we can uh, improve and can make better. But just looking back on how much we already managed to get into this direction is uh, astonishing. When we develop our technology, we of course are driven to develop the best um, in class and try continues to improve the technology itself. But at the end, as I mentioned before, it's just about experience for the user. So it, the design perspective is very essential. So how to bring the technology together in, in 
meaningful and valuable experience for the user. And I think that's where also we feel very connected um, to the philosophy of the golden triangle. And also furthermore, we believe, and that's maybe also, um, I would like to get uh, your view as well. We think about technology um, to can upgrade the further experience into services, um, meaningful um, collaboration, um, interaction. Um, so I think one discussion um, I would like to have with you is how do you see at Mont Blanc the aspect of services um, to bring really additional value from, to the digit, from the digital um, to amplify actually the experience part? Yes, we design first the experience and then we think around technology, which may be a bit different to an engineering driven company usually. Mm -hmm. But I think when we discussed with Wacom, it was we we're on the same level. So it was never about the technology. Technology was always the mean to basically get to a certain experience. I mean, we started a project for us when we talk about the services and additional value that we bring with, with the products that we uh, created together with Wacom is that in a traditional world, uh, when you do notes, uh, and for us, it's in particular doing notes, maybe in a meeting environment or something similar. Usually what you do is you take your notes in a notebook, which is for us, the handwriting is for us the best way to actually store information, process information as a human being is that, uh, but still you have your notes now in an, in an analog format, but then the next way is, okay, how do I share this and how do I make these notes more lively, more more, 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 more collaborative is that basically this was the outgoing idea that we had together is like, how do we bring this into a digital space? So when we worked together, basically we developed, I would say not a note taking product, but really a collaborative tool because everything, all the notes that you took on your own, we basically transfer it to you, all your digital devices. You uh, have handwriting recognition, you can actually store it in uh, the cloud, in your workspace, and then you can directly collaborate with the tools in the cloud with all of your people. And this actually around this one node that you have taken throughout the meeting. And that was for us, uh, and it is still kind of like this, opening up a new world on how people can actually work on handwritten notes. I just feel the journey is like really open-ended. So um, lots of room to explore. Yes, isn't it? <laughs> uh, it is, it is indeed. And I, I think one very exciting point that they actually, and, and we just talked recently about uh, the, the, the missions uh, and the vision of our companies and uh, um, your uh, motto of lifelong Inc. is for us right. very similar. We call it like everyone can leave a mark. Uh, so we believe that everyone in his life can leave a mark. Uh, with the tools that we provide them uh, as, as kind of like uh, a help to them, to support them. When we look into writing, the essence is basically that what you want to do when you write, you want to create, you want to be creative and you want to leave your mark in writing. And it doesn't matter which tool it is. And this journey uh, into the future just gives us more tools and better ways to express our creativity. Yeah, creativity is our DNA, right? And behind Lifelong Inc. Um, also to share um, with you is, um, it's our commitment actually um, to the society, to everyone, that whatever we do with technology, we always have in mind how to contribute to meaningful experience. And I want to emphasize the word meaningful, because at the end, it's not us deciding what makes sense for them. We want to really get the um, connect with the end user at the end and uh, no matter their um, which domain you come from their writing or drawing or even um, trying to accomplish their um, daily work or work with others I was reflecting uh, just coming to my mind um, our joint project right the recent one um, building up the experience also in your Mont Blanc house can you share a little bit whether uh, you get this also from the end user that visiting the experiencing Mont Blanc house Yes, uh, maybe a bit um, of, of context to the Mont Blanc House. So we have this rich history as a maison, which basically goes back over a hundred years. The idea is really to express this heritage and give uh, the heritage enough room. That's why we decided to create uh, a platform called the Mont Blanc House, where you basically have a center where you can 
uh, on the one end connect to the brand, you can experience the heritage of Opla, but also experience the art of writing. If you interact with our products, it, it actually is a, is a very, I think it's a very essential experience because the warmth of, of the resin in your, in your hands, the, the smell of the leather, uh, the nice uh, sound it makes when you write on, on paper, all of this is so important to the brand because these are these maybe micro experiences I just can remember myself um, just when you talk about this, um, like anecdotal uh, stories, right? Where we talk about very little detail. I remember of the pen design and how the pen actually, the pen tip um, writes on the paper or um, on the surface. So I think uh, this is something we have really common uh, because um, when I joined Wacom, I experienced this at Wacom. I was like, wow, <laughs> that's really different way to design product because the love to the detail but at the end, in the, in, in the sum, actually creates this unique experience. Uh, there's a, a clear future together with Wacom to deliver on the promise, um, on the perfect digital writing experience. And uh, it takes time, but it's so exciting, this journey, um, that um, yeah, I'm really happy to, to walk this path together with Wacom. Hello, Katharina. Nice to meet you again. Uh, my name is Sari from Technology Solution Business Unit and Sales of Wacom. Can you please introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, Sari. Uh, my name is Katharina Cho from Technology Strategic Group in Mobile Experience Business, Samsung Electronics. I'm responsible for business development and partnership management for mobile technologies. And my main area of focus is SPIN technologies, which includes Wacom. I've been in charge of Wacom partnerships since 2016. So that makes almost six to seven years that I've been with the Wacom team, yeah. So um, for, the, for, for the Galaxy Note that you said that we uh, you launched in 2011, um, Ever since we have now worked together over 10 years, and then last year it was there, there was a fold, foldable device as well, and mm -hmm. Galaxy S22 as well. Could you recommend any uh, functions? Well, besides the marvelous fact that the S Pen has over 4,000 levels of pressure sensitivity, so it writes just like a normal pen, even on your digital devices. We also have embedded the Bluetooth Low Energy Technology, BLE technology on our pens so that our pens are more than just a pen, digital pen. It could, it could be used as a remote controller mm -hmm. yes, or yes. When, you're taking the, when you're taking selfies, group selfies with your friends, uh, when you're presenting PowerPoint slides with, with, uh, on your smartphone or tablet or PC. So it's like a magic wand to control all of your mobile devices together. And that's what's remarkable about our S-Pens. For, for myself, um, I use also this S22 Ultra for oh, my Ultra, work. Yeah. <laughs> <Thank you. Private. laughs> and I use the most uh, the screen off memo function. Oh, you do? Wow. Yeah, yeah. because whenever I go somewhere for the meetings, I have uh -huh. to, like, there are some places I should not bring any like PC or tablets, only cell phone right. is allowed. So in that case, I use the screen of memo function so that uh -huh. I can take a note here and then I uh -huh. can surprise it after the meetings. Personally, my favorite feature of the S Pen that I use the most is the smart select feature. With your pen, you could actually uh, make GIFs gifts like mm -hmm. with the videos it turns into a moving photo and another favorite feature is with the smart select you could drag and capture a text and it would re automatically read what it is as a photo and convert it to text so that you could uh, copy paste to anywhere all of those technologies uh, between Wacom and Samsung for the S10 we finally, uh, Samsung finally launched the foldable display last year. And I've heard um, the last year Connected Inc. we did together with a, with a video conference. 
at the uh-huh. main stage. Uh, at that time, I've heard there was lots of difficulties to make a foldable display and with a pen, a pen usage availability, right? Right. Ever since we first launched the Galaxy Z Fold series, for the sake of the large screen, we had to have a pen available to use on the large screen of the Fold. But as you said, we had we were having trouble folding the digitizer with the other layers of our display. So in the end, what we did was we had two digitizers for each side of the folded screens. And then we had electronically weaved in between so that the pen would seamlessly write from the one side to the other. Also, for the customer side, the loyal fan side, they also uh, requested for the S Pen usage Mm -hmm. more. All the fans of the S Pens are usually they start from the Note series, and the Note series um, fans, they all love the big screen and the pens used together for productivity and creativity. And not only is the Fold so much bigger than the Note series screen, it also um, is really, the device itself is actually designed for pioneers who are overachievers who really want to make the most out of their days using their devices and they really and for their productivity and creativity they need a pen I really love that idea we both have a uh, same idea that uh, support the, the creativity to make it real and through those ideas we uh, have developed together to make customers to feel more um, seamlessly and naturally to express their ideas on the on the screen on the little screen and it's a uh, portable to anywhere so they can express themselves more uh, freely like without uh, the restriction of the place as time goes by like we used to like when I was a when I was a student, I used to write only like pen and pencil for the note taking <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> in the class. I cannot even imagine like how these days um, kids and students are doing in the like classrooms. But I heard like most students are using their smartphones or tablets or pieces like because the pieces are really like getting lighter and lighter so on in the classroom to taking notes for now so i can see the the generation has been changed a lot from the past and i feel i'm getting old so <laughs> to, to see that, that change from from paper to digital and um like with this, uh, our collaborations together mm-hmm. to make these things a uh, possibility. Some customers want uh, some different designs of S Pens as well. So maybe they uh, ask for uh, the different designs, such as you have released a collaboration with uh, the Lamy or Stadler or Monami in the past. So is there any um, like concept or ideas for the releasing in 2023 as well? Yes, Sari, we're actually planning to launch a new S Pen with Lamy. I can't tell you what it really is, but uh, we had a really great discussion when Lamy came to visit us in Suwon just a few days ago. And we're really excited to see how the new S Pen with Lamy would be reviewed by our customers. That's a great news because I have been using Lamy's fountain pen for like my entire graduate school life. And then yeah. um, I, I really loved Lamy's fountain pen as well. So uh, it uh-huh. would be really great if I have a various selection of S Pen mm-hmm. to use. 
because we have not been able to meet in person because of COVID-19. Mm-hmm. Could you tell us a little bit sneak preview about preview explanation about your Connected Inc. 2022? Last year and the year before that, due to COVID-19, we weren't able to physically attend Connected Inc. at Tokyo. But this year at last, we'll be attending again, like we had since the very first Connected Inc. Um, For this year's session, we prepared a session about how Galaxy devices can be used together to create more productivity for your everyday life. Um, From not only smartphones and tablets, but to PCs. Experienced planning team personnel will be sharing how you could use your device, Galaxy devices together to create an ecosystem that helps your uh, mobile experience. Mm-hmm. And the key role of the productivity in our connected experience is, of course, the S Pen. That's nice. That's nice. I'm looking forward to seeing you in person <laughs> at the venue. <laughs> Me too. I'm very excited too. I'm Kake of Wacom. I'm in charge of the utilization of the several technology that are not available in Wacom from university and other companies. And to create the synergy each other and uh, collaboration with the stationary manufacturers such as Wacom is one of my tasks. So nice to meet you again, Carl san Hi Kake san, it's great seeing you online today. My name is Carl Siegel. I have been working here at LAMI headquarters for around about 12 years and I'm playing a leading role when it comes to building our digital writing business on a global scale. Firstly, I want to confirm, I want to have uh, some questions to you about your history and your vision. Here at LAMI, um, it all started with an ambitious idea. The fundamental idea was to integrate digital writing technology into our global best-selling writing instruments designs. And uh, in this context, it has been very fortunate that around about half a decade ago, uh, Wacom has uh, reached out to LAMI and uh, in your function as uh, the world's leading digital writing technology developer, uh, you have helped and enabled LAMI um, to develop Uh, perfect digital LAMI writing instruments uh, and our first uh, digital writing instrument was then uh, launched successfully in year uh, 2019 and ever since then I believe it's fair to say that uh, we have uh, successfully expanded and built our partnership and uh, we have become very good friends. I have loved uh, really uh, LAMI 10 uh, like that uh, like the post the Lamy Safari and also the Lamy 2000. Really, I love it. I want to know your first impression, Lamy impression about the uh, Wacom. The field of digital writing uh, is a very exciting, um, very promising um, um, field. And given the fact that we always focus uh, on high quality and excellence, um, for us, it is uh, quite natural to choose Wacom as a partner because uh, Wacom uh, certainly uh, plays an absolute uh, leading role when it comes to digital writing technology. So for us, it's a natural fit to work together with Wacom. And uh, um, we are very happy that you came to LAMI and you recommended to us to, to start a collaboration. What difficult uh, did we uh, did you de- develop uh, between the LAMI product and Wacom uh, cartridge? When we talk about our recent launch, which is the LAMI Safari Twin Pen EMR, um, mm. the unique uh, feature about this product is that it combines analog handwriting and digital handwriting within one single writing instrument. And uh, integrating both an analog ballpoint pen refill and a digital EMR cartridge within one single writing instrument certainly has been very challenging from a technological point of view. Mm -hmm. But together with Wacom, uh, due to our very close collaboration, we were able to overcome all difficulties and challenges, and we have Mm -hmm. managed to bring this product to absolute perfection. In this time, the 
you have uh, launched the twin pen. Uh, really, congratulations. But I remember when I first put the digital pen module inside in the Lamy Safari, um, I was uh, really feeling amazing to easy to use. That is uh, really my first impression uh, between the uh, Lamy Safari and Wacom uh, digital pen cartridge. And also, the, really, at that time, I developed the desire to own the uh, one of the uh, these digital pen, Lamy digital pen. Uh, and uh, really, I have to own the uh, your uh, Lamy Safari digital. I always using now. Vacom's key competence is to develop excellent digital writing technology and Lamy's uh, core competence is that we know everything mm. about handwriting. By joining forces, we can create products that uh, bring uh, substantial added value to the end consumer. Um, from our point of view, this is only the beginning. And as you know, we were currently collaborating uh, together on, on the so-called EMR technology. Um, but we wish to expand uh, our partnerships also onto additional digital writing technologies such as AES technology, for example. We also um, want to restart our frequent uh, personal meetings. Um, because, mm. uh, I, I believe partnership is one thing and uh, friendship is another thing. And uh, both of these uh, aspects should come together to, to create a sustainable, long-term successful mm. partnership. Mm. And uh, part of this is certainly that we come to visit you in, in Tokyo. Mm. I still recall the early days of our collaboration. Mm. Um, back, back then, we had already progressed quite far when it comes to mm. product development. Mm. But we were facing the major challenge of um, securing relevant industrial clients for, for our mm. digital army writing instruments. And through the help and support mm. of Vacuum, and great yep. um, events such as the Connected Inc. Uh, mm. You very much helped us um, mm. to secure very sustainable long-term partnerships with industrial clients such as Samsung, Fujitsu and Supano. Mm. And looking into the future, um, I believe that uh, as companies, as organizations and as partners, uh, we need to um, continue to invest into new technologies, into new solutions mm. that bring a substantial added value to the end consumer. Your digital writing instruments mm. and our digital writing instruments, mm. they have helped many uh, educational institutions, mm. many teachers, many students mm. during those uh, difficult days when, mm. when schools and educational organizations were, were, mm. were in lockdown. So mm. there was this uh, remote teaching, remote learning, remote education. And I believe that uh, Vacom and Lamy mm. have made a positive contribution in enabling um, this um, remote education. So therefore, mm. I believe mm. during the crisis, we could make, uh, we have been able to make a positive contribution mm. to mm. society in general. That is a really mm, similar from the uh, partnership uh, between Lamy and uh, Wacom, that is a uh, twin pen, like the analog and digital. That is yeah, really yeah absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's like, yeah. uh, like synonymous uh, to our partnership. We, we are the, let's call it the analog partner, mm. you're the digital partner and mm. uh, together uh, by uniting and joining our forces, mm. we can create uh, great, fantastic products mm. Uh, mm. That, that offer substantial added value to the end consumer. So, so you're right. It's the best symbol of our partnership, and also it's yeah. a great symbol of how our partnership has evolved mm. to the next level. Hello, this is Heidi again. Today, I'm here together with Alex. Alex is uh, a trusted partner, longtime partner for Wacom, but also for the Digital Stationery Consortium for, for many years. So Alex, do you want to give some words about you? Yeah. Thank you, Heidi. So my name is Alex, Alex Fina. So working for Stabler, trusted partner, honest me. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, working for 20 years now for Stabler. I'm responsible for research and development. 
And um, yeah, um, also great company, traditional company, uh, manufacturer of writing instruments. And um, together with Wacom, we developed the Norris Digital and it was a great experience. I can um, share also um, what really um, um, moved me really in this collaboration is we are the we were the pioneers together, right? Bringing analog pencil as an experience with the long heritage of Stedtner, um, together with the digital technology, the pen technology by Wacom. So I think this is already um, really the collaboration was started with a very big mission also together. Uh, the idea was bridging two worlds together. So the traditional analog world where Stedtner is coming from, and on the other side the digital. Um, the digital um, dimension of that, of writing, drawing, etc. And um, the idea was to make the best out of these two worlds. And, then, and um, yeah, the question was, is this something also the consumer can follow? And, um, and, and I remember that after that very, very quick product development, it was the fastest product development we had in, in, in its Stettler history. So we worked together with uh, Samsung and with Markcom in that. The idea was right. So um, also that kind of emotional reaction from the people. So presenting a product which is known um, from, from childhood of writing, learning. So the analog yellow black pencil from Stettler now in a complete digital um, um, specification and also the emotional reactions. So I remember, yes, I, I learned writing with that kind of writing instruments. And now I'm adult, I'm, I'm studying or I'm a, a professional. And now I can really use that known product, that emotional product in that digital way. I was so also emotionally touched, not just impressed, but also touched how the kids are picking up the Stadler pen and I think we will. Um, they were using the jumbo, the Norris Digital jumbo. So very natural starter draw. And these were kids like six, seven years old. So this was a, a nice. Um, yeah, and that's um, that's that's exactly that um, second story we um, we started with, together with Wacom um, to have that next step in terms of digital writing, but using to telling our story from from Stettler perspective that was to to realize um, you call that Norris Digital Jumbo so and that is not only from the from the format um, some some special product um, so also from the function that you have an eraser at the end we created a high performance team at Stettler and also together with uh, the Wacom people so that was really perfect fit that they were here in our development in Nuremberg and we had that short way and that good communication. So how do you, what's your principle? What drives you defining products? What, what do you believe always in? What's your DNA behind the products you're developing? Uh, so um, I'm, as you already mentioned, I'm a technical um, person. So, and I'm, I'm thinking technically, but um, all, the, all the time focused on our customers and the, let's say, the application. So we developed a new way of producing um, wood cased pencils. So based on wood, we can liquefy. So we call that Wopex technology. And based on these technologies, we are really well equipped to answer these questions also according sustainability mm -hmm. um, in the in the future and for the for the current situation. I can share also um, our. Um, purpose or, or our in initial goal when we establish this um, platform is to also allow us as partner not just talking about development but at the same time also thinking about how we connect closer to users to real life um, use cases to promote the value of also digital pen ink paper digital stationery you have the pen of course which is the writing um, instrument and then you have the ink, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, in that interpretation, ink is in the digital interpretation. Ink is the software. So, and this is, let's say, the, in my in my um, um, perspective, the most important um, component, the ink, because it decides in 
for the, uh, in terms of the target group, in terms of the application. If you if you are writing, if you are drawing, sketching, if you if you are a, a professional in, in business or if you are um, in school or as a student at university. So um, it depends on the software. And this is exactly um, the organization DSC where we get from, from Stettler's perspective in contact with um, the ideas behind with new players and companies coming up, startup, um, etc. And, um, and that's so important. From Stettler perspective, we are looking on the product, but um, DSC gives us that framework and that um, additional dimensions to look on the system, mm -hmm. yeah, to look um, on the hardware for sure from the from the paper side and tablet and in other display side but also and very important from the from the software mm -hmm. because this makes the difference software makes the difference totally agree being responsible for <laughs> software at wacom <laughs> cannot more than agree <laughs> yes <laughs> hope you enjoyed the session and uh, bye for now thank you everybody oh, i hope you enjoyed our sessions in connected ink DSC sessions. Bye bye. Bye.
Hello and welcome to this session of Connected Inc. 2022, where we'll discuss why handwritten signatures are just perfect for the digital identity of the future. My name is Ken Kazischke. I am heading the marketing team of Wacom's Business Solutions Unit. And um, well, we'll be talking today about the future of biometric handwritten signature and why, although it might, you know, seem like an anachronistic technology, much like, you know, maybe a record or uh, a fax machine, handwritten signatures actually have a very bright future ahead. So bear with me, um, I will explain. Right. Um, let's start with actually clarifying what a signature is. So, of course, we all have our everyday understanding that a signature is something that you put under a piece of paper to put your name and then to agree to whatever stands on the paper. And that is actually almost true, but, you know, let's um, evolve a little bit. By starting with that signatures were actually invented for business purposes hundreds of years ago. So it's, you know, somewhat funny to think about it that way, but signatures then were a technology advancement so basically they were invented because wax seals proved to be you know not not really reliable also not very you know easy to handle they could be forged they could be stolen so a handwritten signature basically be became this much more user-friendly so to speak authentication mechanism back in the day and what it was used for is of course two people or more people than just two basically, you know, come to an understanding that they want to close a deal, they put it on paper, and then they write their names onto that piece of paper, and by that, binding their will to that piece of paper. And that's exactly what a signature does from a legal perspective. It connects the consent of a person to the contents of a document. So behind your signature on a piece of paper is from a legal perspective, also you as a person. And the nice thing about a signature is, of course, that, you know, it's a biometric expression. It's a performative act that you create in the moment of the decision making. So that's also why we can definitely say that, you know, you consent to something if you sign something, because otherwise your signature wouldn't be there. It's not a mouse click. It's not, you know, a, an accidental fingerprint. It's not, you know, that you looked into the camera and by that your phone unlocked. It's something that you did intentionally. And that is also then reflected in the value of the signature, of course, when it comes to um, the law. So this, the signature, verifies this, the contents of the document. And of course, because the signature is inseparable from the paper, once you ink on it, that, that's the reason why it's also legally valid. To summarize, you know, very simply, the mighty signature it does basically two things. It helps identify yourself and it expresses consent. The signature works so perfectly in the physical world that we don't even think about it anymore. And this, this is you know, true to a lot of technology that's great, right? So you don't think about it because it just works. You only start thinking about it if it doesn't work anymore. The same with a signature, right? So basically in an everyday situation, if you want to sign a contract, no idea for consumer credit, mobile phone, you show up, you say, hey, it's me. I want to do a deal with you, You're, you agree on the deal, you authenticate yourself using an ID, and uh, based on these very simple procedure, you sign whatever. You sign more or less any contract based on this very easy going workflow where there is nobody involved but you, your identity, and you know the other party, of course, which whom you close a deal. Everyone has the right of recognition as a person before the law. That is something that's important to keep in mind when we go further in this presentation. Because being able to for perform legal acts in the digital space, of course, becomes more and more important. So um, we characterized um, you know, the journey that we are on with this image, where we say, okay, on the left side, we have the physical space. On the right side, we have digital space. And in the middle, you know, we have this intersection between human and digital, which is where we from Wacom for Business and generally also Wacom tend to basically reside. We claim this as our space. And we just discussed the person uh, in the physical space and his way of signing. Now, there is a very simple way to, you know, move this signature into the digital space. 
by, for example, using our uh, technology, you know, signature pads and I don't know, signature displays, you will have used them in your life already. So electronic handwritten signatures are, of course, digital, but they are very strongly connected to the real world. Because in most cases, you, you still need a, a personal ID. Then you sign on the device and it connects you as a person to the digital world through the biometric um, handwritten signature. So it's entirely created by you, the electronic handwritten signature, but it's still digital. Now, of course, we don't only want to be able to sign mostly in in-person meetings. So we also want to be able to sign remotely. When we go digital in regards to signing, we risk losing our human agency. In the internet, you know, as this um, cartoon from the New Yorker, I think it was created in 1993, um, claims in the internet, nobody knows that you're a dog. It transferred to our example, it means that, of course, if you're an actor in the digital world, nobody knows who you are. Nobody knows whether you are, whether it's now really me, Ken, um, logging into a system. So we need digital ways to authenticate our identity. But the way we do this right now is depending on something that's called a certificate. And all that basically means is that a third party is from now on vouching for you. So a digital signature is a machine act that is attributed to you. So it's not you signing when using a certificate-based signing, it's the machine basically signing on behalf of you. What that means in the end is that you only exist as long as this third party supports you. You don't have control over your identity. So if you stop paying this third party or if this third party for whatever reason decides to not provide you with a certificate anymore, then you cannot perform any legal acts in the digital space. And therefore, we think that this certificate-based signing is, of course, something that works very well for a large group of people, but it, it has this fundamental flaw that instead of providing you as a person with the full agency, they vouch for you. Thinking about this uh, certificate-based signing, how can we fix that? And of course, the, the general answer is that people need to have full human agency in a digital space, right? So it's it, this is a pretty simple concept. You are in the physical space, a person, you should be also a person in the digital space and have full autonomy as a person. And the solution, and that is something that is a trend since quite a while now, is something called decentralization and a technology standard that's called self-sovereign identity, short SSI. Um, this is based on technology like blockchain, decentralized ledgers, you know, wallets, cryptography. So these are the kind of the technologies that are involved here. But in order to understand how this future will work, I would like to try to give you, you know, a very simple introduction into SSI, into the self-sovereign identity. So what SSI is, is an identifier in the digital space that you solely control and this identifier can be trusted by all. It's very, it's analogous to the to the situation we now face in the physical world. So you, here we see on the in the in the right image here, somebody says, "Hey, it's me." They pull out a wallet. Inside the wallet is an ID card. They hand it over to a person that they want to um, provide their identity with. This person looks at the ID card, um, of course, looks at maybe the image, the birth date, the, and confirm that it's them. That's how it how it works in the physical space. And exactly like this, just supported by digital technology, is what SSI provides. So you go into the digital space, you have a digital wallet. Inside this digital wallet, you have uh, digital credentials that belong to you and with which you now, based on these decentralized ledgers, can authenticate yourself against other parties. So our idea is to combine the power of the handwritten signature with the before mentioned SSI technology and standards. And you see here very much the same image like with the SSI where the, the physical person identifies themselves with the same means as they identify themselves now in the digital world. We sign the same way using a biometric signature. And that is not an accident because why is the biometric signature so important for secure signing? Let's look at a quick reminder what signing is all about. 
The signature does two things. It identifies yourself and it expresses consent. If we now look at how secure signing works, you have to imagine that you pull out a, a, a mobile phone, there's a, you, you open a document, you sign on the document, and doing that is the digital version of a, a landlord, basically in the medieval ages, signing a contract when he wanted to buy three sheep, for example. It's the same thing. You sign a contract, you express your will. Uh, at the same time, the same electronic handwritten signature is used to identify you. Of course, not only the biometric signature is used to identify you, it's used in a basically multi-factor authentication stack using the Swiss cheese layer model. Um, so comparing it again with the physical world where you hand somebody your ID card when signing a contract, he will look at the ID card, will see, hmm, okay, this looks legit, that looks like a real ID card. They look at the image, they look at you, they see, well, this person looks exactly like the image on the, on the ID card. They look at their signature and compare the signature and say, well, you know, seems legit, okay. The, um, the uh, secure signing concept does exactly the same. So they use, you know, the first layer might be the own device where the wallet, which is then used to identify yourself, is, is installed. So the device is the correct one. It's your personal device. The wallet was unlocked using facial recognition. And then the third layer is the biometric signature, but not only the signature capturing, the signature is actually then verified against a template of stored signatures to make sure that this signature was created by the same person that also created the signatures in the template. So we have this you know, multi-factor authentication approach where each single factor has its strength, it, it, has, it has its disadvantages, but together they, have, they form this three cheese layer where each layer has holes, but if you put them on top of each other, no holes visible, so this is basically impenetrable. So again, the signature is used for two things, and that's the beauty. You declare your will as a person, which is required by law, and you use the same biometric signature to identify yourself as the person. The declaration of will and the identification is therefore strongly linked to each other. So it is, from an authentication and identification perspective, a perfect uh, conceptual construction. So. What this allows us for full human agency, because as we learned with the SSI technology, you are in charge of your credentials. Of course, they are leveraging a decentral network for authentication, but the, the, the beauty of it, that is of course decentralized and you own the credentials. So you have full human agency and you have full sovereignty in the digital space using this system. So, and what we'll do now is we'll have a we'll have a look now at the actual technology, at the actual secure signing model. And after that, we will have two more experts. We will have Nacho Alamilio Domingo, a lawyer, a very renowned lawyer in the space of um, authentication and electronic signatures, talking about this uh, concept from a legal perspective. And we will also check out with Nico Calanzis, who is a forensic document examiner. Um, whether the system holds up not only in the legal space, but also in the forensic scientific space. So, and well, and with that, please uh, now welcome Lars Lenz, who will show you a quick demonstration of the secure signing um, concept. Uh, hi, everybody. Now, after listening to Ken's uh, introduction, you should have a good impression of what we want to achieve with the secure signing project. And uh, in the following five to 10 minutes, we would like to show you the secure signing uh, demo application, which can with its current version issue decentralized remote signatures that are based on self sovereign identities um, using cryptographic trust and decentralized ledger technology. Now, uh, when we open the application, the first thing you can see here um, are your recently created signatures. Each row represents a cryptographically secured proof of a signature event. We call them signature credentials for short, because with them you can identify yourself as being the signer of the related document through either biometric or cryptographic verification. A much like an ID can be used to identify uh, you as a person. Now, before we take a closer look at them, 
Um, let's sign a new document and create a new signature credential. And the way we do this is similar to other solutions. You have to pick a document, you have to pick a place uh, where you want to put your signature, and you can add some metadata. Uh, in this in this demo, we choose uh, the document we choose as an example for a travel expense form uh, because we are currently researching intercompany use cases, but the workflow is really quite generic and can be applied to many other use cases. So the data you can add is also customizable, and um, I'll just add some metadata. My role or my title is developer. The reason for signing is uh, approval. And uh, the document being signed is a travel expense form, but uh, we can just call it travel for now. And um, now after I press OK, um, the first thing that happens is that we are requested to apply our biometric signature. This is basically the starting point for the true magic of secure signing and SSI um, starts. So after I apply my signature and press OK, this biometric signature is verified against my biometric signature template uh, using Wacom's G Suite technology. And um, the template is stored and maintained on just on this device. Uh, which I'm currently using for this demo. And um, this provides us not only with the GDPR compliant storage of biometric data, uh, but also with the proof of person authenticating me as the person signing the document. So now I press OK. And um, what you can see popping out in the bottom are decentralized identifiers where we are creating for the document. And um, this is our entry into the SSI world because these identifiers uh, point to a decentralized network. And um, we can resolve them, or anyone who has the method to resolve this identifier can resolve it, communicate with the blockchain, and retrieve the data uh, we stored in the blockchain. The network we are currently using is the IAM network, which is a second layer technology developed and maintained by Microsoft and is and it is running on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. And by giving the document an ID in this public network, we can create an immutable link between the user, his signature, and the document. And this link is publicly accessible, uh, verifiable, as well as privacy preserving and in total control of the user. And we can see a new signature credential was created and um, the best way to show what this means, what I explained just now, is to have a closer look not only at the signature credential that was generated for me as the user, but also at the data uh, that can be retrieved based on the identifier we created for the document. And this identifier is embedded in a PDF. So when I press this verify document button, I can just pick a PDF I signed. And when I click on verify, uh, we are retrieving this decentralized identifier from the PDF. We resolve it, so we communicate with the network um, that represents the decentralized network or the blockchain. And we retrieve the data which is stored there, and we store a service in this data. So I'm requesting the service to uh, get the data we captured during the signature event. This data is secured by uh, a private key encryption from an authority we trust. And um, you can see it here uh, on the top. It's the issuer did. And uh, we also can resolve this and uh, request uh, through the service that the um, issuer can authenticate himself through any means and uh, uh, cryptographic means or any other. Um, what you can also see is some generic uh, PDF or signature data like the author creation date, modification date, um, and below the uh, header signature event, you can see the data we collected during the signature event. Um, you can see that the verification was successful, that uh, the biometric data is um, attached or was captured. Uh, you can see also this signatory did, which is my ID as the user, uh, as well as the document did which is the idea of the document. 
Uh, you can also see the additional information, but um, this is just an example. We can um, put a lot uh, in there and uh, it's also up to the integrator. Okay, now going back to the starting page, we can have a quick look at uh, a signature credential. Uh, when I click here uh, on this, with, uh, what I created, um, I can also see that I have the date of the document in there. Um, it is uh, the issue as myself, so um, this is my proof of signing the document. And um, so the date of the document, we can also retrieve, uh, for example, updated documents and keep track of its evolution. Okay, that's what was basically it from this application. Um, before I end this demo, I would like to show you um, how this identifier um, can be looked up and also the data we store in the blockchain, which is related to the identifier, um, is displayed. So we just go to an endpoint provided by the network, which is this Ion Explorer. I can type in the, uh, the identifier for, of the document, for example, and when I press on search, um, it is or the data collected is collected, which is related to this ID. And we can see here that there's a service uh, attached to the ID. And I can request this service to provide me with all the data um, we captured during the signature event. Um, in the final version, this request would need to be uh, approved of the user who is in control of this data so that it's not a um, it's in order to provide the uh, owner of it with the most control you can have. So that's basically it from my side. And um, thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, please don't um, hesitate to, to contact us, uh, Avna, or myself. And we are more than delighted to answer any questions. And now I'm giving back to Ken. Thank you. Lars, thanks a lot for this great demonstration. So with me now is Dr. Ignacio Alamillo Domingo, um, a, a lawyer that we work with quite a bit in the electronic signature space. Um, Nacho, do you quickly want to introduce yourself? Yeah, good afternoon. First of all, thanks for inviting me to this occasion. It is an honor. Um, I am a lawyer, as you've said, and I've been working the last 25 years of my life in electronic identification systems, uh, digital signatures to services and the like. The last three years, I've been more involved in software identity and being part of the European Commission's team. I now shared in the last couple of minutes the secure signing concept and why electronic handwritten signatures are a vital part from it, from our perspective. What's your initial reaction to that? Well, in fact, I, I fully support uh, whatever you said before, because uh, if you look at how electronic signature have, has worked during last uh, centuries, and how they work all around the world, irrespectively whether we have different legislations, you will see that a good electronic signature solution should uh, support human agency in the, uh, in the electronic realm. And otherwise, it is not a good electronic signature solution. And for this, we need to consider four properties. And this is for any kind of technological approach. A hundred, uh, an electronic signature should provide a unique and real binding with a human being, and that means that only Nacho should be bound to Nacho's signatures. Otherwise, we are creating a potential risk of uh, having different people signing on my behalf. Uh, secondly, an electronic signature should enable direct human agency in electronic space, because otherwise we are creating a place where there will be people with no legal uh, agency with the right, without the right to act directly. And this would uh, potentially create discriminations. And therefore, uh, we, we need to understand that the electronic signature supports the self sovereign identity approach as well. And um, third, uh, an electronic signature solution should promote privacy and minimal disclosure. This is something that uh, not always happens um, because in many cases we need to disclose uh, more information than strictly required to prove, for instance, who we are or what uh, what is our will. And finally, um, a good electronic signature solution should expand personal autonomy. Otherwise, uh, we are we, we will be creating a world where people will not necessarily be able to act. 
and this would be clearly against uh, human rights construction. Very interesting. So thanks for the overview. Maybe we can uh, um, quickly go back to, you know, this, the, the specific to the slide, why is biometric signature so important for secure signing? So um, with, with this construction of the, the signature basically expressing the will and at the same time um, uh, helping to verify the identity, can you talk about this from a legal perspective a little bit? Yeah, of course. Um, if you look at how uh, signatures work in, in real world, and they have worked in the, in the last centuries, they have been associated to two particular functions. One, the main function, of course, is uh, to declare will, to perform a legal act where you assume that you are in agreement with a written text, like a contract, for instance. And this is nice because uh, it happens even if you do not clearly or fully understand the text. So in many cases, we go upon notaries and they explain to us the content and then we say, okay, we agree to that and we sign. But this is not sufficient in the electronic world. In the electronic world, uh, specifically in the, in the new digital spaces that are arising right now, we need something additional. We need the second function. And the second function is precisely to prove who we are. In the electronic uh, ink signature, this is something that happens after. In the case of a conflict, you are able to verify if I was the legitimate signatory by uh, having a, uh, a forensic examiner. But in the digital space, we need to uh, link both functions at the same time, meaning that uh, as you are putting in, in your diagram, you should reuse the electronic signature that you are generating for uh, declaring your will as a factor for authentication yourself, for authenticating yourself. In this sense, if Nacho is producing a handwritten signature to say that Nacho is uh, in agreement with the content of a, a contract, we can reuse this uh, biometric signature as a factor to prove that Nacho is actually Nacho. When you com combine this with other authentication factors, for instance, like a facial identification in a device under your exclusive control, then you have best of both worlds. You have the declaration of will, but you have the identity of the signatory even before the signature is um, executed, before the contract is executed. This will increase the warranties for ev everyone, but especially for Nacho, that will be a, he will be able to self-assert his identity, or even better, in a future world, we could be deriving from our national ID cards or other legal documents our, our identity credentials to bind these credentials with our declarations of will. Therefore, we are creating a better world for signatories and for relying parties. So what you're saying is really interesting. So you're saying that basically we use the same signature to put onto the contract to declare the will as we are doing to verify the, the, the identity of the person. And using then SSI technology, we could even then link to a government issued identity and therefore creating this really strong link. Yeah, that's precisely the point. So if you look at the, at the diagram, you see that we are using the handwritten signature, which is a fact that occurred in the physical world, but in the digital world as well, for these two purposes. First purpose is Nacho is declaring his will. Second purpose, Nacho is proving that Nacho is Nacho. When this is bound, bound with other authentication factors in a strong authentication mechanism, then you pack both functions into one. You get a very strong document uh, fulfilling in and with full evidential value of both things. And this is something interesting because you will reduce fraud. You will reduce the number of times you need to go into code to discuss, and you will be getting something which is even better than qualified signatures. Now, you also mentioned other digital worlds. So what did you mean by that? Yeah, for instance, um, if, we, if you look at uh, how metaverses are appearing right now, these are new types of uh, digital spaces that are super big communities. So they go be beyond uh, Web 2.0, which was the space, for instance, for Facebook companies and the like. And they created spaces where the, we have new digital societies. So my expectation as a user is to be able to project my personality into a metaverse. What is the problem with the current business model, for instance, around metaverses that it, it is starting to follow? the classical business model for communities. In that business model, there is an owner of, a, of this digital space that decides through a contract everything we can do. And this is a potential issue because uh, we should be able to exist into that particular digital spaces 
like are like they are like new universes that we should be able to exist without having dependent that much dependency on other party. In this sense, if you want to move yourself into a metaverse, your expectation is to be to have legal rights. Your expectation is not to be erased or expelled from the from digital space just because you are behaving in a different way as uh, provided for in the contract, which generates constitutional issues. And you, you will have the legal right to act. And for this, you need to be able to prove your identity without depending on a third party. You need to prove your declaration of will without depending on any party. Therefore, in metaverses, we should be moving into decentralized approaches, fully decentralized approaches that uh, will, would support human rights. In this sense, this kind of technological approach is perhaps perhaps the only one that could work. Yeah. So specifically because in metaverses, I could be anybody, but in the end, there, there needs to still be an identity layer that is trustworthy. So this is going to be this is going to be a challenge then. Yeah, I see. I have like, like maybe closing question. Um, um, we are also invited Nico Kalansis, you know, a forensic document examiner that you know because we uh, were on, a, on an event just recently together, um, also to this session. From your perspective, if you if you look at the legal space and the forensic space, how do you see the relationship um, of, of, of those two and how do they con contribute to each other? Well, of course, there is a, a direct contribution from forensic science to, to this, which is precisely the fact that at the end of the day, we are basing this on a physical action done, performed by a human being. So the fact that at the end of the day, in the case of a conflict, I can have a forensic examiner verifying that really was Nacho the one activating this system, the one producing the signature is very nice. For instance, I could create a different, completely different persona of Nacho to project Nachos into the metaverse. But I, in case of a strong conflict, if I had to go into court in the physical world, I could still use a forensic examiner to prove that Nacho was the signatory, because this is a kind of cyber physical system. It is Nacho's signature as a biological construct after all. This means that Nacho could even have different personalities with different pseudonyms or names, but at the end of the day, the proof would be always attributed to Nacho as a physical being. In this sense, this is a perfect solution compared to any other solution based on machine a valid identity, namely qualified certificates. Thanks a lot. I think that was a perfect segue to to Nico, who's already waiting on the line. Uh, so Nacho, thanks a lot again for you know your contribution and for this for this interview. And um, well, um, have a nice afternoon and uh, you know see you soon. Many thanks. Thanks a lot. With me now is Nico Kalansis, a forensic document handwriting examiner from Greece. Hey, Nico. Can you please introduce yourself real quick? Hello, everyone. My name is Nico Kalantis. I'm a handwriting expert. I work at Hartularius Institute in Piraeus, Greece, and I'm also a researcher at Stafford University in the United Kingdom. So what does a handwriting examiner do? Well, essentially, I examine handwriting signatures and document documents to determine uh, authenticity. And this is true for both paper and electronic signatures? Well, since we uh, transition to this new era with this uh, new technology, the electronic handwritten signature also falls under the scope of forensic handwriting examination. So yes, we do examine those as well. So we just heard um, um, uh, Nacho talking about, you know, the legal perspective, um, you know, when it comes to the secure signing concept and the role that electronic handwritten signatures play. Um, but he also said that, you know, of course, science is always, you know, very important to connect it to the real world. So what's your take on electronic handwritten signature when it comes to, um, well, security? How would you compare it, for example, to the original pen and paper signature? And how do you see its role in the secure signing concept? Well, first of all, the electronic handwritten signature has to play the same role from a legal perspective as the traditional pen and paper signature. This means that on a forensic level, it has to be able to withhold, um, to be subject to authentication procedures and to have a forensic framework of examination and analysis that will guarantee authenticity. 
So the first thing we need to check is whether the electronic handwritten signature provides the same amount of information, the same amount of individualistic characteristics for the forensic expert to examine and determine authenticity. And as uh, it concerns my field, the forensic handwriting examination field, I can tell you that yes, this has been dealt with, this has been examined. There's a series of experiments and scientific publications, and we now uh, even have a published and uh, scientifically accepted methodology for the determination of authenticity of electronic handwritten signatures, at least within Europe, through the European Network of Forensic Handwriting Experts and the Best Practice Manual, where the process of determining authenticity of electronic handwritten signatures is stipulated. Furthermore, when we look into the various characteristics of the electronic handwritten signature data and the various visualizations of those data, um, we can see that the electronic handwritten signature as a medium provides more information to the expert. That may be quantifiable information versus previously available uh, qualitative information. It may come in the form of inner trajectories, meaning the movement of uh, the pen when in air that can provide additional insight to the process of signing, which means at the end of the day, the electronic handwritten signature is actually even more secure than the traditional pen and paper signature. So I think I just heard three different points. Um, number one is um, you know, the equivalence of, of pen and paper and electronic signature. So is it actually true that we sign the same? Yes, that is actually true. We have carried out experiments around the world and we have confirmed that the signing behavior of a writer uh, on paper is uh, the same. Uh, as you will find on digitizers, provided that uh, specific criteria are met. Okay, and um, then can you also analyze then the electronic handwritten signature the same as a pen and paper signature? So when we have a handwritten product, meaning uh, the traditional pen and paper signature, what we are looking at is the trace or the ink trace from the writing instrument on the document. That's what all the forensic experts will look at and analyze. When we are transitioning to the electronic handwritten signature, that motion is captured and uh, uh, reflected in numerical data. Using that numerical data, we are in a position to reconstruct different aspects of the handwriting motion and even to combine that data and uh, visualize the handwritten product. But that's not the only thing we can do. We can take advantage of the uh, numerical nature of the data and, uh, as I mentioned earlier, visualize the inner trajectories on the ink trace, something that we cannot have in the pen and paper signature, uh, or even uh, move one step further in the understanding of the dynamics and visualize uh, the data in a quantitative manner, especially when it comes to force and pressure which inevitably leads us to various different forms of appreciation and understanding of the handwritten movement and the dynamics that lie uh, within it. Okay, so this looks then as from an analytical perspective, an electronic handwritten signature is way superior to a pen and paper signature. So that you can, you have a, an abundance of data available that you don't have when looking at a pen and paper signature. That is correct. We do have additional information that we never had access to, like the inner trajectories, and we also have better quality of information for the dynamics. Okay, so we understand now that an uh, electronic handwritten signature is you know, at least equivalent to a pen and paper signature. Uh, if not more convenient to actually analyze, but that leaves that still leaves the question: Why should we use an electronic handwritten signature at all? Because there are there are other electronic signature uh, types that may be more convenient to use. So, what's your answer to that? To be fair, the electronic handwritten signature is the only electronic signature that cannot be decoupled from the owner. Every other form of electronic authentication can be utilized by another person with the appropriate access. 
the handwritten signature is tied to the writer. And each time you execute a signature, this, uh, the handwritten product is unique. You can never sign the same way twice. So there's a dual uh, type of uniqueness in the handwritten product. And that cannot be matched or um, surpassed by any other form of electronic signing. So I think that's an interesting question. Let me quickly pull up um, the slides that I that I shared before. So what you're saying is that the electronic handwritten signature is unique every time. So basically, when signing a contract, I will always provide a unique signature, and therefore also this will help to well make sh well to to guarantee that um, the the security of this process because if because given that I ever see a, a, a signature that's the same, I can be sure that it's a copy, correct? That is correct. If uh, a forensic hundred examiner looks at two uh, signatures uh, on photocopies, for example, and they are uh, completely identical, then they can be certain that at least one of them is a forgery. And if uh, nothing else, the two uh, reproductions of the signature have the same source. But going to your slide, what I would say is that um, when adding a biometric signature, handwritten signature to this bundle of your SSI uh, solution, you guarantee two things. First of all, you guarantee that the person is necessary to be there and execute the signature for the transaction, for the process. And secondly, you tie a specific unique handwritten product to the specific transaction. The uh, device you're using, the certificates you're using, even your face, they're going to be uh, equal and identical in every process of signing. The only uh, part of the puzzle that is going to be unique and therefore uniquely tied to the resulting uh, digital document, that's going to be your biometric uh, handwritten signature. So what it sounds to me is that that you say that the electronic handwritten signature is kind of a unique blend of perfect attributes for that. So because it's it's created in the physical space by a person in the moment, but also it's represented immediately in the digital world. Can you yes. comment on that? Uh, yes, because uh, the electronic handwritten signature is constructed in the physical world but reflected in the digital world. Therefore, it incorporates the uniqueness of physical action with the uh, security of the digital infrastructure. So it's a perfect crossover of the two worlds. Thanks, Nico. I think that's a great finishing statement. Nico, thanks Thank a lot for much. your contribution and yeah, talk to you soon. So what's left to say? Well, of course, we believe that all technology should serve people and be human. That's a pretty common place. But in the case of signing in the digital space, we believe that this goes way beyond the usual talk uh, about usability and user experience. In this case, it's about the fundamental necessity that people have personal and human rights in the digital space and that they, are, that they need to be able to perform legal acts without being dependent on a centralized third party. And this is why we believe that handwritten electronic signatures will continue to play a vital role in our self-sovereign future. Thanks a lot for your attention. And if you want to discuss more about electronic handwritten signatures or about the secure signing concept, please reach out to me or to Lars. Thanks a lot and enjoy the rest of Connected Inc.
All right. Hello, everyone. Take, take a seat. <laughs> Good. Welcome um, to Connected Inc. 2022. Welcome to everyone here in Düsseldorf in our Experience Center. And welcome everyone online. So happy to all have you all here. And today I'm opening the second day of um, Connected Inc. 2022. Um, before I dive to the agenda, what will happen today, um, let me share a little bit what is Connected Inc. and all, and um, why are we coming together. And as you can see here, so Connected Inc., we, we always use the theme creative chaos because we want to um, create an open stage, an open platform where we invite partners, um, researchers, people from science, but especially also um, our community from art, from um, creative um, um, community, as well as from technology um, community, as well as from education. So we want to invite them to all come together and um, share their ideas, share their perspective, but also share their personal stories or um, innovation cases. So today um, we will talk a lot about technology, but overall in this um, Connected Inc, we have really colorful mixture of art, education, technology, in essence, creative chaos. And we at Wacom, we are facilitating um, Connected Inc. since 2016. And it's always driven by our um, dedication to bring technology um, together with partners um, to deliver um, for um, value for the customer and for the community. So that's for us also an initiative we have started to give something back to our community and to our partners where they can share really um, what they believe in, what they're working on. And this year, and same with every year, we always pick open questions. So open questions um, to inspire and to um, trigger um, discoveries, exchanges, um, and explorations. And this year we have picked two questions. One is, um, have humans um, really evolved since their origin? And Today, and more than ever today, I think everyone, we feel the same. So our life has been upside down. There was many, many unexpected happening in the recent um, years and months. And we feel it's also the right moment right now. We together as human beings, as community, as society, um, together, together and reflect. Did we evolve? What are the opportunities? What are risks and fears? And what are the needs where we need to go as a society? And the second open question um, we have put this year is, how much have technology really contributed to human creativity? And this is for us a very essential question because for 40 years, we have been always um, devoted our technology innovation, our products um, to develop tools that make human to live their creativity. And we have been also part of a transformation journey with um, many industry partners, like in the creative industry, like in education, but also in the whole um, business workflow, um, business um, um, solutions industry, um, to make pen and ink interaction meaningful um, for human beings. And for us, it's also important here um, to step one more and look into a reflection. So, have we really contributed or is there more opportunities we can do and where can we go together also together with our um, partners and communities? And this brings actually to the theme of today as well. Um, but I want, before this, I want to show also Düsseldorf is one, just one part of Connected Inc. Um, because Connected is a global event and this year we have decided for a two weeks program with many, many sessions. Um, I think over we're talking about 70 um, sessions right now um, that will happen over the globe. Um, we are talking about 130 and more speakers um, that will um, join us in, in the Dauphin locations. And Düsseldorf is one station um, of um, the events which um, will happen on site and with, uh, as well as um, online. But we will have sessions as well in, in Shanghai, in Portland, in Seoul, in Korea, but also in um, Japan, Tokyo. And today we're here in Düsseldorf, we are in day two, and the theme today is Technology Day. And let me walk through a little bit what happened today. 
So actually the day started earlier already in the afternoon here in, in Düsseldorf, where we have two sessions that are being um, 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 streamed online. So one is um, the, about Digital Stationary Consortium. It's an industry platform, actually, um, where partner have found it together with us and to think about and to work on um, how to bring new categories of digital smart stationary solutions to the market that makes sense, actually, for everyone to use. And it's not just a pure translation from analog to digital, but really applying technology to make them really useful. And it's an industry platform because we don't just talk about technology, but we also talk about how the use cases will evolve um, in the different domains. Um, and here you can see um, um, several brands are actually joining us in, in this journey. It's, and Digital Stationary Consult was also founded in 2016. And you can see um, we have companies from IT like Samsung, um, like um, Fujitsu is also part of members, but also we have um, very famous and traditional brands um, from the stationary market, um, like Lamy, like Städtler, um, like Mont Blanc, um, being also um, founding members here. Um, the second session was also online, so this was um, about um, signature, because signing is a very um, intrinsic and natural way of confirming your identity and confirming your consent. And we at Wacom, we have also worked with our partners on thinking about how digital ink, so signing with digital ink, can further um, really increase the level of security and identity and represent yourself actually in a digital space. So with all the trends happening right now, it's the right point. So from ancient where people sign on paper um, to today where Web 3.0 talking about putting the human in center um, to allowing people to have their own digital identities, we believe the signature is becoming super, super relevant um, to bringing in this linkage, the one-to-one -one linkage between the digital identity and the human. So these two sessions were online. They will be also available on YouTube for later um, watching. So just check out on the YouTube channel, just um, search for Connected Inc. Um, then you can also have a check on these two sessions. So today, um, here on site in Düsseldorf, but it will also be shared um, online, we will have three very interesting technology um, collaborations. Um, and joint innovation um, projects that we would like to share. And number one is um, Cintiq Pro. Cintiq Pro is Wacom's um, creative flagship product where a lot of um, professionals in the world are using it really in their daily um, professional life to create designs, to create products, to create um, content like movies, games, et cetera, et cetera. And today we are very honored actually to have really visionary artists to show how they use a creative tool um, in the no new technology domain, like creating for Metaverse, creating um, in 3D. So here, um, stay tuned uh, for the session happening um, next to this. And um, the next one will be CRI. CRI stands for Creative Rights Initiative. And it's a technology innovation, but also it's an industry. Um, movement initiative we, we have started together with many our partners to work on a service that allows artists um, to protect the, their own authorship and copyrights of the art they have created. And this is also a, a big topic connecting to the Web 3.0 um, topic or environment where we believe that artists with their, we should have their own identity at the same time also um, owning the rights um, for their own um, artwork. So here we will have a very interesting um, discussion among the different um, um, stakeholders at Wacom working on this technology and the service, but also with partners um, who really wish also share their view how meaningful um, this can be um, for the creative community. And the last but not least session, this is also um, a technology um, innovation collaboration. We um, have worked together with partner. Here it's about um, understanding meaning of ink, where we will talk about ink data itself, because ink data today is mainly a graphical um, data. So our ambition together and our vision is, let's bring ink data to a way that has meaning, that it can coexist with text, images, videos, 
um, to really have its own position in the digital space, allowing also AI technology to use this data to enable or to deliver meaningful services. And here, so Marcus and also um, Thomas here, um, they will share also how the relevance of data annotation as a technology foundation um, will um, drive um, this momentum to establish digital ink as data, as content um, in the digital space. So lots of innovation um, stories, collaborations, um, use cases. So I'm um, very excited to have all the partners here um, sharing um, their stories and sharing um, their personal projects. And before we dive into the sessions, let me also th share a big thank you to our partners because Connect Inc. is um, not uh, something that we have built by ourselves. It's really also always a joint um, work with partners. And just to name here, um, DigiHub, for example, um, local community really um, driving a lot of um, startup supporting activities. We have DSC, as I mentioned, the industry consortium around um, digital stationaries. But also we have the um, partners from Lamy, Mont Blanc, Städter here, and Vivid is just also um, a local partner here in Düsseldorf, um, really um, promoting um, the colorful startup scene and um, um, here in Düsseldorf. So a big thank you to partners and a very big thank you to the speakers um, up front. With this, I would like to hand over to Silke, who is our host tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, to talk of. about what yeah. happened. <laughs> Thanks. We talked about it. Yeah, thank you, Heidi. Thank you very much. Hi. It's like yesterday. Nice people in the audience. Um, welcome again to Connected Inc., the second day, Technology Day. And uh, yeah, I would like to greet you here in the cinema. Happy that you're here. And maybe we can say hello to the internet again. Maybe have a wave because we're live streaming in the world. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm Silke Rogermann. I'm kind of a tour guide, confrocier, host, call me, whatever you like. Uh, I try to connect the dots between the different sessions and days and topics and really inspiring um, parts of Connected Inc. And um, yeah, I'm just here for accompanying you to give you a good atmosphere, a good vibe. And uh, yeah, Heidi already spoke about the sessions to come today. And so um, I'm also kind of a timekeeper because we have a quite strict timekeeping for the different streams and Q&As and so on. And so I'm looking forward to the next session. The next session will start at half past five. And until then, we have some minutes break. You can use this for a bio break, get you a drink at home, of course. And yeah, I think we'll be back at half past five and then I tell you more about the upcoming session. Thank you and see you in a few minutes.
Hello and welcome back to the Technology Day of Connected Inc. 2022. Our next session is Cintiq Pro and the Future of Design Creation Exploring the Metaverse. And when we are online and connected ah, to the speaker panel, hello. Can you hear us in Düsseldorf? Hello. Yeah, ah, sure. We yes, can we, see we and hear you. Hi. <laughs> I just hello. make a very, very short introduction. Um, our guests in this session are Alessio Tomazetti, Head of Architect and Designer, Professor at IED University and Rufa University in Rome. Andrea Ciampo, I hope I pronounce it the right way, digital artist and concept designer, and Ulu Vazeyi, Susaya, CEO of Gravity Sketch. I hope I did it quite okay for you. Oh, that's good, that's good. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, they'll talk about the Cintiq Pro and exploring the metaverse. Uh, and after the session, we will have a live Q&A here from the audience and of course the viewers from YouTube. So the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you much. much. Thank you. And I'm very proud to be to be here uh, this evening, uh, and I'm proud to introduce you, Andrea and uh, and Shay. And we'll start to speaking about uh, digital, because yes, uh, it's uh, uh, Wacom uh, is a, is a tool to work with digital and. Uh, uh, Andrea as an artist and Shea as a designer and the CEO of Gravity Sketch to speak about uh, which is the point of digital actually, which is the state of art in this moment uh, to connect the, the man to the machine uh, in a digital way. Andrea, you can start and then we can just have an interactive conversation also with Shea. Thank you. Okay. I go brief about my career sure? and my yeah, uh, digital art experience. So um, I'm a concept artist and designer. Um, I say also designer because my background is um, um, in, as an industrial designer. So I've studied, I have a bachelor on that. But then as a hobby, I started doing like concept art. And then actually from a hobby became a profession while I started sharing my art online and getting uh, job offers. So um, through these years, I really um, experimented with different uh, media. Um, I went from digital sculpting to digital digital painting. Of course, not to mention Wacom as my first, you know, like tablet and like always had a, a Wacom. And then, of course, I was one of the early adopters of VR. And that's how I met uh, Shay uh, and the Gravity Sketch and all the uh, VR sculpting and VR uh, and AR uh, world. So um, this is it. Yeah, yeah. I, I love uh, I love your story of going from being an industrial designer and then moving into the concept art. Um, myself also industrial designer, working primarily with um, IT products like uh, laptops and smartphones and things like this. And I, I found such a struggle to communicate early concepts and early ideas to teams that had to manufacture these things or teams that had to figure out how the electronic components would marry with the industrial design components. And so I didn't expect to, to develop a software, but I found that like the tools were actually the only limiting factor to the imagination. And so I remember at the time it was like, how do I get my fingers inside of the digital world? And the only tool at the time was definitely the Wacom. Uh, the Intuos is what I can afford at the time. And it's a, a great way to get your hand into the into the computer somehow, you know, through the sketch. And once VR came out, it, it felt like the perfect moment to leave my job. Uh, at that time, I was working at Jaguar Land Rover and, um, and start this business with my co-founder where we started to explore the, the idea of having a, a communication platform. So although people think of Gravity Sketch as a creation tool, of course it does that. But when you're creating, you're, you're just trying to communicate. You're trying to share the idea that's trapped here with the audience that needs to consume it and, and take some actions upon it. And so meeting with people like Andrea and um, other folks from our community is just super exciting to see how they use it in completely new ways that we haven't imagined yet. So uh, both of you choose uh, just uh, the, the best tool to have uh, a connection. So uh, it's my history as well, because I started to use uh, my first tablet, my first wagon in 1997, because I really want to have 
the best natural approach to, to digital, to, to drawing, like, a, a, like an architect, but also design and art, so digital art. Uh, which is the best approach? Which is your setup when you are just uh, producing your art and design? We'll go first. <laughs> I, I yeah. mean, for yeah, yes. for me, the, the setup is like what it's, it's kind of down to the project. So depending on what project you're going to start off with, uh, or sorry, depending on what project you're working on, that's what you're going to start off with. You're going to figure out what works best. And sometimes the physical approach is always is often the best. Just pen and paper might be quick, but I think what technology and what the digital world allows you to do is take that and and layer infinitely, right? So I can either have a stack of pages of different sketches, or I can start maybe one sketch, maybe it's a thumbnail sketch on a piece of paper, take a photo, and I can bring it into Photoshop, and I can continue to work on that. Um, however, if I'm working on something that is more of a problem-solving type of thing, as opposed to an aesthetic approach, like how do I fit these two components together, I might want to actually get physical pieces of like cardboard or foam and like play with that first and then maybe use sketching as a communication bridge between the physical um, and, and, and even the digital if I go into a Photoshop sketching environment or something like this. And with VR, it's been great to do things like taking photos um, to do the 3D imagery, the, the kind of photogrammetry and bringing that into VR and then arranging things and figuring out how the problem might be solved before diving deep into the, into the creative, uh, more stylistic journey. But for me, it's, it's all about what the set of constraints are and what the problem that you're starting out with. And that's kind of where I decide what, what elements I want to bring to, to it. But I think as humans, I often find myself going to something that's very physical and tactile first, maybe a little bit less digital. And I think the tools are starting to get to the point where I can go straight into the digital, um, but maybe I'm a bit old school as well in my thinking. Okay. Okay. It makes sense. And for you, Andrea? Wow. Well, it looks like he stole my words. <laughs> like I, I know. I, I mean, that's, I think he covered pretty much everything and I'm um, like kind of the same. Um, I don't have like a huge attachment to physical when I, when it comes to um, put down ideas, because one really important um, uh, teaching point at uni was one of my mentors. He said, never sketch something before you have a clear idea in your mind. Otherwise, you're gonna influence what you're gonna do, you know, by the sketch, limited sketch you have. So I always like try to use my mind before actually going into something physical. And physical, I, I still, in a way, um, imagine the digital how we have it right at the moment. You know, like Wacom is still a, 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 digital, a physical object um, as um, um, in between me and the actual digital. So. Um, I, I, I don't see, you know, like the need for now to go like through um, pencil sketches, even even though sometimes I, I do. Uh, but yeah, I'm really like full into uh, technology and I, I always wanted to be like early adopter of um, new new things to try. You know, it's always like, how can I uh, make this abstract idea have in mind become something visible to others, you know, not only for me, but to others. How can I share what I have in my mind? So. Um, it's interesting how the future, in a way, it's toward uh, this, you know, and yeah. also thanks to like Gravity Sketch, because the first time I was using like a tool, imagine my first time um, in a room, you know, VR room with uh, Jama Jurabev, another incredible artist, and we were experimenting, it, it was, a, I think, early stage um, of Gravity Sketch, we were working together, sharing pieces of pixels and uh, voxel and nerves, whatever, like sharing things, you know, like we were chatting in, in the room, sharing, building together was amazing, you know, and nothing exists of that. That's crazy. I just put a, a, a VR set and that's it. Yeah, yeah I, I think the way that you, like you described it is quite interesting because it feels like if possible, like the dream scenario, at least for me, and I, I listen to Andrea, I think he's influencing me a bit, but the dream scenario, maybe I have three computers and like, you know, one computer has, has Photoshop open, has Cintiq set up. And so I, when I get the idea, I don't need to find the paper, open the tab or find my you know tablet, open the tab, close all my other, other windows and then start sketching. Like that little bit of friction, it really messes with my creative flow. But if I had like a separate computer here, I have Photoshop open, I have my tablet, I can just start sketching the idea. 
a separate computer over here, you know, with the mm -hmm. VR headset set up. And then I have like, of course, my mood board inspiration on my main machine. I think that would be the dream scenario. But finding like the harmony and like the right operating system is probably something we need to tackle in the future. Because I think like to, to the point you made, it's like, I would love to be completely indoctrinated in the technology, but sometimes like little pieces of friction, even if it's like closing a window or like muting an audio or something like that, it, it, it makes me just go back to the paper quickly because I know how fast I can pick up the pen and put a mark down. And, and so this is, I think this is the only little bit of friction I have. And then virtual reality also offers a little bit of friction as well, because you, you kind of close yourself off from the, the rest of the world. So these, these things, I, I'm hoping that the, the technology landscape will evolve enough um, to maybe even voice activated just pops up a window and I can start being creative. And then mm -hmm. I can go back to my kind of pragmatic work of answering my Slack messages. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So we are in search for uh, every time on something new, something more uh, experimental. And uh, usually designer and artists use technology in an alternative way. So maybe if we have just a leaflet of instruction, we can just uh, throw up that and uh, start to use in a mm, very uh, dark way without having uh, any, you know, uh, screen or frame between the, uh, the interface and uh, our action. Um, what do you think is the, uh, the way of uh, changing uh, our future in a uh, professional way, just making art and uh, uh, design uh, using the VR. Because the first time I used the VR, uh, the best thing for me as an architect was just doing uh, uh, my stuff uh, scale one to one, because it was impossible just to uh, have, you know, with, uh, with a screen, even a, a huge screen at uh, 32 inches or, you know, 60 inches, but it was impossible to make a building scale one to one. Uh, when I started to experiment with VR, I can just see my building one to one enter and uh, you know go up and uh, uh, use the elevator there and something like this. It was amazing to me. I go first. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Can... I mean, it's um, in the future how I see. I, I sometimes I, I really try to like um, put myself in like ten or twenty or even like fifty years and how it'll be like how can my job change like physically, you know? Cause now I have like three monitors plus the Wacom, super. you remove one I, and I go crazy cause one is for the chats, one is for the references, one is for the the main colors and one uh, is like whatever, like we, we have many objects and, but you know, seeing how, for example, last uh, meta uh, device can actually replace like all the monitors. And it's, it's just the beginning embryonal phase uh, imagine like in five years, 10 years, where what you see is so sharp and real that you don't really need anything physical around you. And probably like, it's going to be even less, like, of course, like something like. Yeah, no, my, my, a... my glasses, for example, just having everything here. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. The... But maybe, you know, I don't know, like, this is like more like sci-fi for some people, but probably it's not, you know, but probably you, your glasses won't be needed. You know, because we will advance so much in eye surgery or like anything like this is so old in a way, you know, like we'll be probably like clear from any device and probably will be uh, initially talk to anything you, we, we need. Imagine like you have a VR set and you have no more mouse, no more pen, no more nothing. And you, you move your hands and you see things and you, you think uh, at first, probably you will have to talk with this device, but maybe like, oh, move this, like it's a assistant, you know? And then probably once we go there, it's gonna be like, you just think and, and you you go there. I'm, I'm, I know this, is sound, this sounds like really into the future, but um, um, I wouldn't be surprised if this, something like this pops up like in five or 10 years, you know? even less, you know, we've seen with AI, how crazy it went from zero to crazy results. Yeah, I mean, you could you can definitely imagine um, a scenario where you can summon things via voice activated. And I feel like a lot of the films as well, they give us a really good insight into because people in the films, they think unrestricted. So it gives a good insight into like where people's the general minds are going and like maybe the ether of like creative uh, industry is kind of moving. And, but one of the things I love about the technology that's out today is that there is no one that's like, 
here's the operating system, here's the suite of tools that you have to use with it, it's completely open. And the access to these tools is also very open. You can use Unity and Unreal and like these tools that you can learn on YouTube to build your own experiences. So I think we're in such like a unique moment where the designer and the artists and the creatives could actually define what this tool is used for. Whereas in the past, we didn't, we weren't able to define what Photoshop was used for. It was used for editing photos. And over time, we adapted to that interface. We adapted to the brush menu. And then we, we, we won an expansion of the brush menu. And then we won like different layer features and things like this. But now we're kind of starting from a clean slate. And I feel like when we talk about this new world and VR, I kind of want to remove the word VR. I think it's a limitation for us to think about a platform or think about a specific technology. And to Andreas's point, it's like maybe it's a cluster of technologies. And you walk into in a room, your tool set kind of greets you. And, and if you walk out, it automatically saves the file or saves the work that you've been doing so you can return to it. It's very similar to our existing ways of working as creatives. If we are creating like a physical sculpture with stone, you leave your workshop, you turn off the lights, you expect the stone to be there with the same progress that you made last time with the tools exactly where you left them. And I feel like this is where we can maybe start adopting the word of like spatial computing. I know it sounds like kind of a little bit techie and I'm trying to stay away from this because I want it to be approachable. But if you think about the interior of your house, the way you lay out your kitchen, is so you can have like a good effective way of like cooking your food. And I feel like we can have that in the digital world very soon. We can have that in our 3D immersive spatial computing environment. I, I think looking behind the screen all the time to, to get your work done is it kind of makes us too much focused on this. And like, there's this whole space around us that I can use and my body can actually gesture certain things that activate certain things. And so I feel like we're, we're just entering the space. And if we enter it with designers and artists driving, we are going to create some amazing, amazing ways of working. And it will, I think the limitations will be um, kind of non-existent really only our imagination is the limitation here. Yeah, so more technology, more advanced technology, but even and very easy to use, like uh, our human being could be just the, the right interface to interact with everything and just to, uh, to work with software and hardware in a very natural way. Like, you know, something similar to cyberpunk uh, uh, theories, you know, or environment, just speaking about uh, not only books, but also animation and something like that. For example, my experience that the work created by Masamune Shiro was something that uh, was in my mind, blowing my mind uh, every time, just connecting myself and just have the possibility to interact with uh, uh, our the other, other designer and artists and people and connect and see uh, other things like the metaverse is just doing something actual, but was just a theory about 30, 30 years ago, but it's becoming a reality now. Uh, so, Mm, what do you think uh, um, our uh, mind uh, could be just uh, um, helped by, by digital? Or uh, is it just a, a very interesting uh, question? Do you think that uh, another intelligence could help us to do something? Are you referring to like an artificial intelligence? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> very yeah. We were talking this way while we were, yeah. When we were talking just before we got on on the on the call before we went live. I was talking about Damien Hurst and how he has a lot of people working in the studio to help him to generate you know multiple pieces of artwork that have his same aesthetic and his same theme, and he can select certain things that he wants to put forward. I feel like the you know an artist that's just starting that maybe hasn't built up a name and a reputation as well as he has. They have that potential now with a uh, with AI. You could feed it your influence and feed it your aesthetic and even your previous work, and then you can generate multiple instances of your work that you can then um, put forward. I, I know I'm not the resident art expert. Uh, I'll, I'll hand over to Andrea in a moment, but I think like, this is really exciting. You can almost use this as a support um, and and really like play off of the the way that the algorithm may be accumulating certain ideas or certain images and certain like shades and tones and colors um, where you just don't have the time as an independent artist to do all of that, you know, and, and produce a body of work that's as extensive as some of these more seasoned artists. I don't think it will make the art a higher quality. I just think you will have, you know, more resources to kind of explore more ideas in a, in a, a smaller period of time. 
And Andrea, could be a challenge for an artist like you. So you have experience as an artist and just uh, working with your um, with your works, with uh, with your uh, art piece. It could be a challenge for uh, for an artist just uh, challenging with the AI and doing better than the AI. Um, I'm so happy, you know, we 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 were we are like progressing so much lately, but in a way it's also scary you know it's scary not because i'm scared of losing anything i'm scared of not having rules you know i'm i'm, I'm fully into ai i i love the i think i i started using ai 2017 18 with the first like online devices where you could generate like uh, randomizers or like this kind of really um, rough shapes generator it was amazing to like brainstorming or like uh, generate like uh, different kind of images like when you look at the clouds and you see things you know like I wanted to generate something to look through and then give my input now it's it became as I said before in less than a year um, from something cool to something unbelievable you know like um, in a way it's scary how there are no more there are not yet um, rules on how you sh you can use images as um, uh, data in, inside this artificial intelligence. And then that's another topic. Uh, it's too long to, to, to start now, but um, the copyrights or no, like um, there are many artists that are really pissed by AI using their own images in their database, because now basically what they can do after 20 years of, of career, AI can do in 30 seconds which is amazing, you know, like in a, on a side, I'm like, wow, you know, imagine how in a way uh, we can affect quality, you know, because like, especially in movies and video games, the problem lately, uh, probably you have noticed, but the quality is not really great, like even for um, big studios or like Marvel movies, Disney products is not really yet a good, like even the VFX where you expect something good looking, you say, even the normal person viewer not involved in any cg vfx uh process can detect oh this is something wrong this is so badly done uh probably ai can fix that you know like um i don't know if you remember but a lot of movies they they had a fake face like um uh, double digit uh, the digital double uh -huh. and th with ai already two years ago they were replacing saying oh look ai can do better than artists you know, and it's fine. Why don't we use it? And I'm, um, you know, I just, um, I'm not concerned. It's going to help. It's going to, for me, bring the quality up, especially because we're not more, we, we will be uh, not limited by the tools. As I said, probably we, we're going to just text things. And depending on your taste, uh, your experience, how good are you are at picking good images, there's going to be like, for now, it's like wild jungle, but probably there's going to be the one who can use better the AI, you know? So in a way, we will re-establish um, professionals, you know? Like nowadays, everyone can produce like amazing images with AI. And in a way, um, we can be confused who's the pro, who's not the pro. But I'm quite sure in five, 10 years, we will clearly see who can use AI in a really innovative way or who can use it as a, I don't know, um, music band who wants an album cover in 30 seconds. You know, they can do it and it's amazing. But, yeah. you know, it's, yeah. a, it's a different approach how probably I will be able to, to create my own movie probably with AI generated videos and whatever from my from an idea without the need of millions of budget um hundreds of people working on that but assistance you know like working with you as uh, shay said um you, it's like having a, a a big team working from you and this team is like clever smart goes straight to the point it's not um you know missing a shot apparently lately you know it's like crazy good quality yeah yeah. Um, what about your workflow, starting from, from Andrea? Andrea, you, you work uh, as an artist, but you work also uh, as a designer for visual effects. And uh, it's different to just work 
for yourself, just creating an art that is more uh, inside you, with you, with your ideas and other things like that, or uh, would a customer will ask you exactly that thing in that way, okay? Yeah. Um, I think uh, through the years I developed this kind of love for um, um, being in one software when I, when I do personal work. I just want to chill and I want to be there. And now I picked ZBrush for uh, the past like five years. I like I write. I just like to be there and create uh, my own style. Uh, who's been lately like posted on uh, like my social media and stuff. Lately, I'm only posting this kind of uh, style, but it's really really different from client work. Because uh, client, of course, you need to be up to date with all the new technologies. You need to be able to deliver high realistic images, especially for um movies and video games mm -hmm. uh, which is not something i'm interested interested uh, in doing uh in my spare time uh, i used to be now i'm more like towards different um styles but still um i'm i do pretty much everything like from 2d painting 3d uh, sculpting modeling and rendering and again vr and I, I hope I will never stop, you know, like even though I, I'm doing, uh, I'm, I'm now an independent artist and I can do whatever I want and I spend pretty much time on ZBrush, I still go sometimes in Blender or in Kishal or other softwares where I can really uh, experiment the next generation of um, softwares and uh, even AI, I've, I've tried a lot, you know, you, I, I don't share everything I do, but I, I love to to stay up to date and I'm, I'm I'm really really excited to what's next and I think I'll soon jump on the new uh, VR headset and and try new features. Okay, thank you. And Shay, which is your your typical workflow and uh, uh, the just the, how can you interact with a customer? Right. Yeah. yeah, I find myself nowadays, I'm doing a lot of example workflows for customers because I can't share what one customer is doing with another customer, unfortunately, like verbatim or even like imagery. We have very high profile customers that are very sensitive about yeah, the work know, that they do. You sure? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm like reenacting some things a lot and I try to actually follow their workflow. So my workflow is actually like a hybrid of a customer's workflow with maybe a tool or a process or a thought that they may not have that may help fills in the gap of a pain point that I've identified. And so what we see with a lot of customers and maybe the auto space is they're working like very heavily in the Photoshop arena, but they're limited because they have to recreate different views and perspectives. So what we're finding is like, we identify in the studio with them, maybe one or two views that they really like or that the senior designer likes to consume a, a piece of content from. And we'll start to work with just uh, volumetric information in virtual reality. And then they can take those images out and put them back into Photoshop where they can use um, the Cintiq to sketch over and create like, like volumes of different angles and perspectives just based off of one initial drawing. And we find that really helpful. And then we try to like get them to encourage them to later st stages of the process to actually start working directly in 3D, whether creating a short animation. Um, recently, we've been um, encouraging them to put a GLTF files into a PowerPoint presentation. Um, I don't know if many people know this, but you can just put that in and then in the PowerPoint presentation, you can click on the image and rotate around, which is quite cool. So trying to find new ways of presenting work has been a, a big challenge for us, but I typically just try to mirror what the, what the customer is doing and then help them solve some of the pain points. And it's usually around how they communicate the, the design and the intent of the design. And for example, you use it, you, you are uh, uh, just uh, able to, to share with your customer directly with the VR, even if they are not physically with you, uh, the project, the presentation, and uh, all, all, all the, the things you can just uh, create it for them, for example. This is something totally, yeah. totally new, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. We did, because of the pandemic and everything was kind of locked down for a few years, we did all of our customer onboarding virtually. So. We joined in the virtual environment. We showed them how to work in virtual environment. We've ge recently generated a screen companion application that allows people to view what the VR person's viewing, but also independently navigate with their keyboard and mouse. And that's been a huge win for us just to get people into the 3D space. And some companies have actually adopted this over teams for design reviews because they find that every independent person 
whether they're in VR or they're behind their screen, can navigate from their own vantage point, leave comments, leave annotations. And so I think the power of collaboration is really changing around the 3D space. And we're seeing, you know, the, the very, almost like a twin to what's happening in the 2D world with Miro and Figma and, and these tools where you wouldn't even imagine not using those collaboration tools if you're going to generate a new uh, 2D interface, for example. You just, that is just the tool of the industry now. And I feel like we're moving towards that in the 3D arena where you're just never going to be able to manage, imagine like not being able to invite someone to your ZBrush sketch. Like it just doesn't make any sense in the future. Like, okay, I'm finished with this. I want to invite them and I can give them some certain rights. Like you're a viewer only, or you're an editor or you're a presenter. You know, it just feels like if you can keep the conversation happening in the tool that the work is being done in, it makes it so much easier for the creative to continue to work on top of the feedback. And so this is where I see things moving it. And, and this is why we're pushing very hard on that collaborative front. And we, we do see the, the Wacom tablet being a very strong part of that, uh, because right now in our screen solution, we have a very simple sketch tool. So if you're behind a screen, you can go to a certain view that someone in VR wants you to see, and you can just sketch on top of that view really quickly. So it's very similar to how you might do in a design studio where you see someone's sketch and you just put a piece of paper over it and just sketch on top really quickly where you want them to change the direction. And so I think there's like a nice kind of blending of the different technologies to create like a really nice collaborative experience so that communication can flow a bit more smoothly. And even more today is uh, totally real time because uh, without lag, you know, uh, monitor, synthetic monitor are even better with uh, 120 hertz. So, uh, and with a, with a good connection, you know, you can just do everything real time just uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, artists, designers, uh, you know, uh, in every field. That, that's mm. incredible. I think this is the, the future. Uh, it, the future is uh, totally real time. What do you think about it? Um, again, I think real time, um, but we will probably will not, we will probably not use 3D anymore. I mean, again, jumping towards like, um, um, decade or, or, or I don't know how fast it's going to be, but AI is going to be a replacement for anything three-dimensional, generating probably uh, a sequence of images. You know, it's already incredible how, um, I don't know how this is techy, but like disco diffusion, stable diffusion, they can generate like a video from a sequence of images and then they create like interpolation between them. And it's crazy good how it's, you know, something so new and fresh and how you can, in a way, imagine, and you see them like turning, you know, it's not only a 2D point of view. I think it's gonna take a while, of course, but um, in the real future, uh, probably we will have like, because um, everything we need is like something generated, you know, and it's frame, you know, what, you, what we see is a frame of something and in movement. Um, um, uh it sounds inter interesting when you say yeah, yeah, but we in, can in use short, 3D yeah. no more. Yes, it's yeah. strange, but, but it makes sense. Yeah, but in a shorter future, um, um, I really don't know. <laughs> I think we will be like, uh, we can improve. Like, I, for example, Wacom is improve, improving like um, every time um, their hardware, you know, like, and the latest. Um, um, update by the way was like incredibly satisfying for me because even like the touch screen and the frame yeah. rate you know having Cintiq Pro who can be really like um, a piece of hardware on your desk and improving your workflow is like something really good but I can't wait to see the first Wacom product for you know something really immersive you know um, and I'm sure it's going to be there you know like leading one side and then for creative probably you will have to adapt to what we, we've been said uh, so far so uh, I'm, I'm really excited in general or like even movies you know it's not only the input who's gonna change uh, yeah. and changing is always the output you know i am 100 percent sure there will always be the classic movie we know nowadays so screen something film and you're gonna see but probably we will be thrown into immersive experiences and imagine you can watch the same movie from different characters oh, point of view yeah. 
Imagine, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, imagine one time you are the, oh my God, I went straight to the most scary thing, but one time you might be the victim, one time you might be the killer or like horror movies or something happier, I don't know, different characters and you can like, in a way, feel what you see, color can change, heights, because if you're a kid, probably everything is going to be seen like from a different point of view, if you're like, I don't know. I'm really excited for uh, what, what's going to next, um, want to be next. So, and yeah. I'm 100% sure hardware will help for a while. So, definitely. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. story, the storytelling is going to change. That's, that's what I am excited about. Like how we yeah. tell stories was always from one vantage point, and telling stories from different vantage points could really have an impact on the viewer. Yeah. 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 Now it's time for the QA session. So we have the, some, some uh, questions by the, the audience, uh, and we started. Thank you. <laughs> thank I you grabbed, so much. I grabbed the mic. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you. Applause, applause. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I heard that we already have some questions from the online audience. Shall I pass the mic to you, Julia? Thank you. The first question is, um, seeing that VR conversations usually quickly move into XR, do you see XR as the natural next step to VR or would the friction of disconnection in VR maybe also have a place in the creative process? Yeah, I, we often find that like people talk a lot about like they want to name it, right? So they talk a lot about VR, XR, AR. Um, and I really encourage folks to think a little bit about like the spatial computing because ultimately like these are like building blocks. Like we, we don't say smartphone and like Blackberry anymore or like I guess Blackberry was a smartphone, but you know, we won't say smartphone and Nokia anymore. We, it's, all smart, it's all smartphones, right? Or it's all, I guess we just say phone. It's all kind of merged into like a device um, or a smart device even. So I feel like these things are merging and we struggle as humans to kind of define things so that we can maybe put certain things against it. But I don't think that that's the, maybe the best direction for us at the moment um, because there's a, there's a place for these different um, experiences that we're creating, right? If you're essentially trying to create something from scratch, it's beautiful to be in a world that's just completely empty or have context, right? Be, I can be in a desert if I'm gonna create you know, a portable, um, shelter for the military or something like that, you know, being in the scene where you're going to do, develop it. And in AR, when I'm in an environment or an augmented space, I can, you know, add or amend something in my house or something like this. So I feel like if these things are going to merge into one and you just define what the starting point is, or you define what the conditions in which you need that certain, that certain scenario. Okay. Thank you. Do we have here in the audience any questions? Oh, I've enough. <laughs> I take, I oh, sorry. I, I see. So um, I know Gravity Sketch has come a really long way since uh, I know you guys uh, from back in the days. Mm -hmm. And I'm still very curious about how Gravity Sketch is now working towards transitioning from, like, uh, or let's say not transitioning from, but transitioning in between the 2D and 3D workflows, because we all know that these two have their benefits. How do you imagine an ideal interaction here to be? Well, I feel like it's a, it's a bridge, right? Like there's, we, we've been working in the 2D space and most of the work is done every day. People are behind screens. And we see that there's a huge benefit being spatial, especially if you're working on yet to be fabricated ideas. I mean, just seeing it stereoscopically is just so much value. But getting people to that point is really challenging because it's a huge cliff. Although we say VR is easy and you know, Gravity Sketch is easy to use, it, there is a cliff. You got to put something on your face. You got to disconnect yourself. You got to put a weight that pulls your head down that you're not used to all the time. And so, by having a, another means of getting into that 3D environment, we find that that leads people to be more familiar with maybe getting in from a virtual or maybe even from their phone at some point um, from a more immersive piece of technology. So, from us, it's almost like we've create a really awesome experience for creatives and collaborators alike, spatially in the spatial environment. But we've discovered that we kind of neglected the people that are a little bit hesitant or a little bit shy to this technology. And that's a large portion of people. 
And so now we're kind of almost going back a little bit and making sure that we can be more inclusive. And as we grow our team and as we get more investment, we're able to do this. But holistically, I feel there will still be a need for maybe laying on a planar sketch or having a conversation via screen, especially if you're on the go, and then jumping into an immersive environment when it comes to you know, refinement, iteration, some other types of feedback, maybe even manipulation of certain ideas with a technical team. So for us, it's, it's more of like building on top of the vision about communication, um, which our company was founded on more so than purely VR or purely some sort of immersive technology. Thank you. I think Julia has another question online. Yes, another question from the chat um, is actually to Andrea. Uh, on your personal artistic bucket list, what is the next skill or next app or platform that you would like to master? <laughs> hmm. Um, good question. Great. So yeah, sure. the, the question is more like what's next, not what's next to master or what's next. So um, probably as I said before, um, I will always have my like nest where I will like create, like for now it's ZBrush, uh, digital sculpting. And I, I love to go out of my comfort zone. So imagine like I built my little house or castle, however you want to see it. And during the day I go outside and I, I like, I go for adventures. I like to like take different parts every day, whatever. But then I know at night I have my, um, protection, uh, and, and my safe area, uh, sorry for the metaphor, but, um, nowadays I, I still, I feel I. Um, I'm, in a way, even if I, I change path, I'm still there. I'm not really exploring new new things. Uh, that's why I'm excited to see what AI is gonna bring. And probably AI is, as uh, Shai said um, about VR, we can even soon like remove the word AI. You know, we we will use the technology for something completely new, um, as we are not anymore using. Uh, any words for, I don't know, even the protocol of uh, how we attach images uh, to emails, you know, who cares? We just put the image in the email and you send, that's, that's the final output. So um, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, um, but probably what I'm interested in now is like creating something for, since it's also a topic of the, of the, of the, of the talk today is metaverse. So probably try to create something, you know, where you can go in and experiment and explore my, my words. That's something I, I really would like to um, put more time and I will soon. Thank you. Thank you. More questions? Raise your hands. I think we're through. We're done. <laughs> Such a complex topic. <laughs> 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 the whole time I have to think <laughs> about the um, movie AI from Steven Spielberg. It's, I think, 20, 25 years old already. Do you remember this one? Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. This, this would be also a parallel universe to this AI we are now today talking about. So this is so multidimensional and uh, it's a bit scary, by, but I'm also so curious what will the future bring. So yeah. thank That's you very, very much for joining us here on Connected Inc. Give a big applause to our speakers. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for having us. Uh, Alessio, Andrea, thank you as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Andrea. Yeah. Thank you. Do so up to just let us speak about a uh, little bit about the future, but you know, uh, we have to see, we have to live and see what's happening and use it in, a, in the right way. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Appreciate Bye. your time. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Yeah. So I'm here for connecting the dots. The next dot will be at half past six, then starts our next session. Um, in the meanwhile, there's a QR code uh, where you can um, engage yourself with the Wacom website to, um, I think, with a newsletter. It's connected to our newsletter. So that you're also always informed what's happening next here in the magic place. Um, at 6.30, we will continue with the session, how to set up CRI, the Creative Rights Initiative, as a secure digital rights management solution. 
See you in about 16 minutes. Thank you.
Hello and welcome back for Connected Inc. 2022. Our next session is about to start and the session is called How to Set Up CRI, its Creative Rights Initiative, as a secure digital rights management solution. And I heard that the panel will introduce itself. <laughs> Heidi said me. So it's very easy for me. There's Michael. Hello. <laughs> Michael, the late one. <laughs> <laughs> so I pass it the stage to you. And uh, it's not uh, just a session and after that the Q&A. So it's going to be a discussion with all of you. So a open discussion. Have fun. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Zilke. And thank you, everyone, for choosing to spend your Thursday afternoon with us. We are very happy that you decided to join us on this technology discussion about Creative Rights Initiative. And um, before I hand over for the uh, panelists to introduce themselves, let me quickly tell you what CRI is about, because you will be hearing this abbreviation quite a lot tonight, CRI. So CRI stands for Creative Rights Initiative. Creative Rights Initiative is a project that was started by Wacom and partners together um, in order to bring about some sort of a, um, guideline for creatives to navigate in the digital space on how they can better manage their digital rights and uh, most importantly protect themselves against uh, misuse and manipulation of their uh, creative content. So with the Creative Rights Initiative, what we ensure is that we allow creatives to securely and uh, in a non-temperable way record their proof of creation and uh, permanently record this uh, through our services so that as a creative, no one has to ever worry about proving their authorship to anyone ever again. Secondly, uh, because we empower the creatives to, um, to have this proof, we allow them a secure mechanism to transact in the digital space by using real-world legal framework that allows them to, um, it, let's say, in the best of way, delegate usage and de uh, development rights to, their, um, to anyone who might be interested. So we will be discussing the technology behind Creative Rights Initiative today and discussing with you how this is a secure solution. So my name is Avinav and I'm the product manager for Creative Rights Initiative and I've been in this journey for two years now so I'm very thankful uh, for this. Um, I pass over now the mic to uh, yeah, maybe from, uh, from that side, Heidi, sure. <laughs> to for introduction. Yeah, let me introduce myself. My name is Heidi, Heidi Wang. I work for Wacom and I'm leading the ink division at Wacom. Uh, in short, ink division is all about digital ink technology and use cases. And one of the major innovation projects we have been working on is CRI, Creative Rights Initiative. Jörg? Thank you very much. My name is Jörg Roskwetz. Um, I'm in charge of the blockchain business unit and web, web3 development inside AMD. Um, we are working on the hardware perspective, um, specific on the security topic, because at the end, you are developing the content. Um, CRI is protecting um, your identity plus your content, making sure everything is, um, is right. And we are doing these um, points on the hardware side at the data center. Um, and um, to protect the keys, for example, if you want to exchange um, those um, digital content, or you just want to store them. Thank you. So my name's uh, Josh Gifford Burley. I'm the lead software architect for Wacom's Inc. division, working with Heidi. Um, but for the last couple of years, I've been working on the um, CRI initiative, and in particular, <coughs> looking into um, both the security side and anything sort of Web3 and blockchain related. Funktioniert's? Yeah. Okay. Hello, my name is Michael Klein. I'm a creative and uh, 3D animation artist since end of the 80s. So I'm a, some kind of a pioneer in this industry. I'm working for over 30 years now in the animation VFX industry. And since uh, 2017, I'm the course director at the Media Design University here in Düsseldorf, next door, um, for digital film design, animation, visual effects. Thank you. So um, we want to kick off our discussion by uh, talking about how does uh, CRI establish a traceable proof of origin and uh, value proposition. And um, before we go into the technical details of this, maybe it is very relevant for the audience to understand uh, why 
Wacom went down this path of uh, creating a digital rights sol uh, so management solution. And here, I think, uh, Heidi, I would like to start with you. Uh, maybe you can help us understand that why a, uh, Wacom, uh, why a digital rights management solution is very relevant for our users today and what motivated Wacom to go down this path. Yes, sure, let me share. Maybe also a bit of history and the anecdote behind, because I think Sierra is, a, is an innovation project that I see it's really representing or really a meaningful case study for disruptive innovation. And the motivation point was really about Wacom's vision. So it's called Lifelong Inc., where we believe technology is, at the end, to be there to serve um, human beings, especially um, um, creative customers here in um, connecting to our creative heritage. And at the same time, we have a technology that was established called um, signature technology, where at that time, we already established that in the business workflow, day-to-day -day, um, workflows when do transactions, that the human signature in a digital way is really something that is unique and traceable to the individual. Um, and earlier today, actually, there was a session just about how digital signature is the linkage to the digital identity connecting to the real human. So with these two um, pillars, actually, we came up with what can we do? So we were discussing, actually, this was a brainstorm um, activities I, we started three years ago in a company. Saying, what can we do more for the creative user that we are serving for so many years uh, with tools and technologies to help them to do their creative work, to develop and um, live their creative journey? And then we were saying, oh, that's a great idea. Why don't we bring the essence of the digital signature technology with our passion and dedication to deliver value for creative users and connecting to what's going on right now in the digitization where digital identity become more and more relevant and more and more important. And especially with also then, I want to then pass over to you, Jörg, talk a bit about decentralized technology. It's giving really the opportunity to let creatives, to let artists own their identity and own their rights when they create. So do you want to share a little bit about what I mean with the centralized technology environment? Thank you very much. Of course. Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting topic. And um, we have last time we have spoken about um, blockchain. Um, we have spoken about crypto and all the different um, features. The NFT um, um, trend we have seen also for creators to get them um, developed and to get them signed and secured. And um, now we... And this time we already have spoken about blockchain is more a kind of an API for many things in that field. Um, I think um, the better term is Web3, um, where we are moving in the next um, stage um, of the internet. So um, it's becoming more 3D. Mm -hmm. um, it's becoming um, more dense, um, what we have seen um, before. And um, the decentralization factor is a very important factor in terms of the security. Because um, static system, we only, always need to trust an intermediate, right? So if you um, shut down the server, I can't access the data. Correct. If you are deleting the data, they are gone. So um, how can I make sure that my data are secure in, in the best um, um, way? And um, here, blockchain technology is giving us the right tools to make this happen. And um, there is also an initiative like um, IPFS, um, Decentralized Storage, Interplanetary um, File System. And um, this is exactly enab enabling this um, kind of technology. So you have multiple um, servers around um, the globe um, in different um, countries, in, in different um, cities, where everybody who is connected um, to the grid will not only host the data, they will also validate the data. Mm -hmm. So that means um, once you upload the data, it will make sure that you are the owner and everything um, specified um, in your um, art drawing, for example. And also, once people are downloading the file, you can give the permission, you can make sure that the right people are getting the content. Um, you are making sure that those data can't be destroyed, which is, by the way, another um, positive ex aspect of blockchain. So um, people can't destroy um, those artwork. So there will be only um, copies available, or you can change permissions. You can change um, the smart contracts, the ownerships, and all these kind of things um, around. And um, this is very fascinating, because we now see all these blocks moving together. 
So, um, and this is very important for artists. This is important for the movie makers. Um, this will be important um, for, for medical, um, to host data, um, for any kind um, of business, um, to store um, and um, to run signature on, on those things. Mm -hmm. And we have spoken about NFTs is nothing else than um, an enhanced level of digital rights management. And um, um, CRI is including this and um, making this available um, to the customers and specific to the community and the artists. Mm -hmm. So just to touch on the CRI side, I mean, you say we look at um, NFTs, the technology that we're using on the CRI side, um, this more sort of self-sovereign identity. We talk about the distributed web, and you, you say, uh, say for example, if I host my files somewhere in traditional web, if the server goes away, they can be deleted. Um, however, the same is true of your identity. So say, for example, I've got a Facebook login. If Facebook goes away tomorrow, or if Facebook decide that I shouldn't be able to post what I'm posting tomorrow. I effectively no longer exist as a digital identity. And um, we know with SSI, with Web3, your uh, ID is owned by you. You control it. You just, you know, so as a user, as an artist, you have that. And the reason I sort of pick up on that point is because that's one of the key design philosophies behind the CRI system is trying to sort of empower the artist and make sure it's all sort of using the new technology, using Web.3, but that's a really important story in that the artists themselves, the users themselves, control access to their data, and it's not to do with the server side, right. and if it goes away tomorrow, it's still there because it lives mm -hmm. on forever inside of the distributed web, and I think that's sort of a key message that we have for the CRI system and for Web3, and I hope that this is what Web3 can do going forward. Yep. Um, thank you, Joss. I want to pick up on this topic and hear uh, M Michael's opinion here on how important is having this proof of authorship data for an artist? Like, how often do artists get challenged by this aspect that they are required to prove um, if they did something? And how difficult is this process of, uh, let's say, establishing this proof? Yes, um, this is, of course, a question what drives me for over de a decade because I'm running a studio in Düsseldorf and we have all the time this issue that clients don't mention mm -hmm. the rights. Yeah? They think, for instance, I'm doing a commer for a commercial uh, so-called demo part and we are developing the pictures based on 3D data. And we had many times the discussion that the client thinks he owns the data, but said, no, the data is the source code of our pictures. And every time when this comes um, into discussion, it, it gets into stress, yeah? Because I can't prove that I'm right because I'm not a lawyer, yeah? Mm -hmm. So I can just offer them to pay a lump sum to get the data for a competitor working with our data. Uh, that is the point at the end. Um, <coughs> or um, they have to live to hire us next time. Yeah? And in the most cases, yeah, I, I, I argue with my point of view, then we have, of, of course, a stress situation, but at the end, they come back. Yeah? But this is a point, and then, uh, because um, um, to this topic, I'm very happy that you found some kind of solution, because the topic is very complex and complicated, and um, I'm discussing that all the time with freelancers. Uh, how can we deal with our intellectual property? Yeah, Because there is, of course, bigger agencies, they have a department and they know exactly how they get the buyouts from my work yeah? to the client, to the, to the final client. Uh, but for us, it's too complicated because I would, hi would have to hire um, an, a lawyer working out a, a, f a contract. This costs me again money. I have, and no one does it at the end, even especially um, the solo artists, yeah, like the freelancers. Yeah, they put away their work at the end for free. Yeah, they get paid for time, but not for the value of the work. And that is what, something what I discuss with my students all the time. My students ask me, of course, uh, how does it work? I said, okay, there's one major rule, don't think in hours think in the value of your work. Mm -hmm. I know it's complicated because this needs a lot of experience yeah, that you understand when I'm working for 30 years in the business and I have an idea in one day, this idea could cost 10,000 euro at the end. Yeah? But the client says, yeah, your idea took one day. 
So what's your day rate? You say 1,000 euros and say, oh, that's too expensive and they want to lower us down. So actually what, has, what Avinav presented to me was this is a good start because now we have something where the artists don't have to care about anymore. And that's the big point, because artists, don't, they want to do their creative work and not think about business stuff. Yeah? I was forced to get into the business routine as a creative, and that was really painful, to be honest, uh, because um, I had to learn the stuff by losing money and the hard way, and to find a point where I try to talk to the client very open, even if the client is, let's say, annoyed about my behavior. I say, why do we want to have extra money? For, because it's our source data. You can have it, but then please pay the same price you paid for the whole project, and then you can use it for, for whatever <coughs> you want. Mm -hmm. And if there would be something like, let's say, I have a 3D scene, and here go to this, uh, to this uh, website or whatever, or to this application, and there it's defined for which cases you can use this 3D scene, yeah? That would be really helpful, because I never would hire a lawyer to, to work that out, to negotiate with a client but this way, then I will lose the client. That's actually my status on this topic, yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank you for sharing this insight. And maybe it's a good uh, time uh, to pass to you, Joss, again, to talk a little bit about how we create this bond, because we've been talking about here that there needs to be a way for people to find out who the author of an artwork is, and um, how do we do this in CRI? Yeah, but, uh, it's, um, so I mentioned earlier on, so we have this concept of SSI, so an artist has their own identity that they can create, <clears throat> they can own the keys to that, and then in SSI, we also have the artworks themselves or the projects live as entities in their own right. And they're kind of cryptographically related. But there's two kind of key technologies that I think are important with the CRI. Because it doesn't really matter if we have this great relation of, okay, there's an artist ID, there's a project ID, there's artworks, etc. You still need to be able to actually bind, firstly, the artist into that realm, sort of bridging from the physical world into the digital world. And we do that, um, Heidi touched on it earlier on, through our kind of biometric signature technology, we call it. But that, in essence, if, as an artist, you sort of, you're, when you sign off on your work, you use your kind of artistic mark, your signature. Um, w our technology um, allows us to actually compare that signature that's been captured at a point in time to verify that the artist is who they say they are. And it's a, a bit more sort of philosophical than that. So if you imagine that Say, for example, you're logged into my machine, okay, and I create, you just create a sketch on my machine and you click upload. For all intents and purposes, from a digital perspective, it appears that I've uploaded that. But if there's a stage that requires me to take that kind of biometric and validate it, then I can kind of guarantee that it is the artists themselves saying who they are. But the other side of it, the more kind of human side of it, is that it could just be a biometric with a fingerprint. It could just be a biometric with, you know, an iris scan. But the act of signing is kind of like a physical, like a kind of human act, especially when we talk about, when we talk about contracts, when we talk about artwork, you actually sign off and you kind of in, intentionally, it's an intentional action that you actually do. So it really kind of helps the artist bind themselves into the system and it does actually act as a bridge between the physical and the digital in the world. And on the other side of it, we have another technology. Uh, we call it the Micromark technology, which is once the, artwork has been added into the system, um, we actually have a way of putting that mark inside of the artwork itself. So the artwork can be freely distributed through standard mechanisms. You can upload it to you know, um, your Instagram, your portfolio, you can email it to a client, but the mark itself is still present inside the work. It's invisible to the human eye, mm -hmm. but you can actually take the end result and put it back into our system and then get into all the information and that's important for two reasons. One, to prove misuse, but also if as an artist I'm, or you know, a designer, I'm being honest and collecting my sources, I can drop it into here and I can actually request from somebody and say, look, I want to build a 3D model based on your concept. And I can get in contact with that artist and actually create that agreement between the two artists in you know, a couple of screens, click through, and everybody's safe and legal. And it's, that's the kind of technology stack that we're using. It's very important to 
So from a very technical perspective, link all those things together, but also ensure that from the user perspective, from the artist perspective, it's just simple and it gets out of the way. So we have the power of the stuff that we talk about, we know Web3 and all those relationships, but as you said, Michael, you, know, you had to learn the hard, hard way. We are trying to create a system that is just there and it's just part of, just gives all that sort of advantages but doesn't get in the way of everybody. Um, I usually work for the, uh, the, for the middleman of the final client. And the middleman is the problem, not the final client. <laughs> because um, today I have now a final client and the final client is asking, asking me about the topic, about the use of rights. But now I get into another issue. I have no, no paper which says, okay, or ask the client, how long do you want to use it? And then I end up in giving it maybe a wave in hope that we do more together or give, and if I give it away, it's unlimited. Because when I start for one year, then it's getting complicated because in my small studio, there's the only one who could keep track of the, the rights after one year. I have to put it maybe in, in my iPhone, uh, alert, yeah, no, you have to remember, I have no structure for that, no, no infrastructure or no, no people who are caring about the rights. So, but what I found out that after 10 years, <laughs> um, that the client is not the evil guy, it's m mostly the middleman people. I mean, the client have the cost controllers and all this stuff, mm -hmm. what drives you mad at the end. But um, <laughs> the, the, the problem with the rights, um, you can talk to the client in a very calm way on a professional level, but then you need to have the professional knowledge, how, what, what kind of rights can I sell to the client now? Because you will pay for that. Yeah? And if I have something simple, <laughs> it would help me a lot. I think you are now mentioning um, the point um, where blockchain is coming in. It's the intermediate, right? The middleman, as you, as you mentioned, um, which is the problem um, which you need to trust. He's doing his work um, <laughs> appropriate. And um, this is exactly what we are defining um, with smart contracts in that area. So that means you are um, the developer, the content developer. You are defining the fees, um, maybe the longevity, the copies, um, whatever parameters are necessary. And then you don't need the intermediate anymore. As you mentioned, you don't need to spend time with a lawyer. Um, so you need to activate um, or you need to do this brain stuff before you create. Um, your staff, and then um, you can work with those parameter in an automated um, system. And I think this, this makes it so cool and um, such secure at the end. Yeah, I want to just amend this information because um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really cool because like um, the, 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 be the benefits that Web 3.0 technology brings to our faces, it really helps us in removing this intermediary, intermediary services that are required to manage these transactions. And on top of that, it, um, it is decentral. It, it puts the user more in charge, which is very important. But here, what we faced um, as a challenge was in the legal space of things. They're, like, they don't understand smart contracts. They are not there in, um, in regard to uh, how, you know, how digital rights are managed in a completely Web 3.0 case. If you go to Dusseldorf Court, probably they won't care about these things. So what we tried to incorporate in the concept of CRI is to bring the real world legal mechanism into the Web 3.0 space. So what we ended up doing was that we uh, ended up allowing users to create uh, legally valid contracts, so end-to-end uh, -end contracts between two parties that can be enforceable in most court of laws, but managed in a completely decentralized manner. So basically, you have contracts recorded in an IPFS layer that are uh, recognized by DIDs, and then uh, the system allows you to generate a legal document that can be enforced in any court of law. So I, I see this as a very uh, nice intersection between the technologies that uh, enable us to remove these middle parties to manage transactions and bring the real world uh, framework that governs at the end of the day all the copyright structures and all the uh, delegation of rights uh, as we call in, uh, in this area. So yeah, I think that's a very interesting perspective about the system that we, um, it was difficult but um, yeah, I think we found a good way around yeah. it. May I ask a question? Because I think we are, and that's what we believe at Wacom, where we build a vision 
leveraging the Web3 technology, which is built on mutual trust, on fairness. So it's a beautiful vision, I think, to connect to the pain point you raise and um, about, okay, we, we have, we're creating a system that is fair, transparent. Um, we have identities for the artists. We have identities for each of the artwork that is protected by the Micromark. So sounds, I'm speaking out loud, so sounds wonderful and nice, like Utopia, but based on reality and knowing that blockchain already being adopted in many industries. So what do we need? together to get this vision become reality. So any best practice you want to share or questions that we should answer? Uh, maybe I start. Um, so I think it's a combined approach, mm -hmm. right? So um, it's the software ecosystem um, combined with the hardware ecosystem. So we're talking about out of the box experience um, specific for the, for the artists or for, for anybody who is dealing with this kind of technology they don't want to understand how the bits and bytes um, are running. And um, maybe a good example is the internet end of the 90s. So um, in that time, we need to program HTML to, um, to define a web page. So today, nobody's programming a web page anymore. It's, um, it's just um, clicking buttons and um, click and paste and um, putting um, the boxes into the right place, done. Everybody can do it. Um, the only thing is the people just need to have the right idea um, to place the content there. And similar um, with, with CRI or other Web3 um, technologies, um, we need to work on an API. And um, CRI is, is a perfect example for it where the customer don't see the technology behind exactly. anymore. Mm -hmm. They just see, oh, cool, it's working. And I have benefits. I can solve my problems. It's more secure if people ask me about the identity um, of that picture or movie scene. No problem. Um, here is um, here are the data um, legally approved in CRI. And um, just think about what you can do else with that technology. So um, we are starting now with, with content like um, art, like movie scenes or pictures or whatever. You can, you can also do this um, with um, medical history, um, land registration. Just think about that things where you don't need the intermediate anymore. Um, you have the proof point, undestroyable and uh, reliable and right. um, with a clear history. That's the other point because you have a clear history. If the document is 10 years, 20 years old, no problem. We can still find out who was the first owner, for example. Oh, yeah. That's why you connect this to the IPFS technology, right? Where you have this permanent exactly. record that is not exactly. destroyable. Oh, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I want to bring into this conversation is that um, when we hear blockchain, like there's usually very mixed emotions in the right. wider community, because like when 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 you say blockchain to, um, to let's say a non-technical person, they usually imagine something like a cryptocurrency, Bitcoin that burns a lot of money or you know consumes a lot of electricity around uh, to 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 burn the CPU cycles. What they often have in their head is this like uh, proof of um, work. Uh, workflows and all that stuff. So, um, Joss, maybe this is a question to you as to um, how would you explain the blockchain technology that we are adopting? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. So, the, yeah, yeah, so the, the, uh, the blockchain that actually we're using currently on uh, for the CRI system is what we call a consortium blockchain. So it's, it's Wacom and our trusted partners that run the blockchain. And we use a technology which is called proof, proof of authority. Um, to actually validate the blocks that go on that chain. So the idea there is that they're trusted nodes, so it's a, the entire partnership through the entire consortium, and there's no actual sort of CPU cycles that are burnt for that. Um, there are a number of reasons that we decided to take this approach, um, primarily actually um, the environmental reasons. I mean, before, as Jörg will tell you, you know, we were working at, talking about earlier on today, uh, one of the big moves for the Ethereum merge that happened was this idea of reducing that kind of um, carbon cost. But there are, um, you know, disadvantages to it and advantages for, um, to that approach. Um, one of the reasons that we decided to go down the um, SSI approach, why we decided to use DIDs, is that these DIDs are inherently resolvable across different blockchains. So the actual technology itself allows us to host those on this consortium blockchain, but it can still be resolved elsewhere. And in the future, if we move to a different sidechain technology, the DIDs can still be connected. So it's even further than that. It's like by doing this approach, by taking this approach, we can link 
a lot, all the bits and pieces together. If another um, Web3 technology comes up that's interesting, we can connect those into your story, into your history of a particular piece, or indeed your kind of life as an artist. And we can connect all of this together with SSI. Um, which brings a question, actually. This is a question to you, actually, Jörg, thinking on it. Um, we've been talking quite a lot. We heard the presentation before ours about the metaverse. Mm -hmm. And it'd be interesting to hear how you think the sort of where the metaverse, when we talk about Web3, what the metaverse is, and how you feel that ID and these kind of rights we've been talking about are going to be a problem and how that's going to apply in the metaverse. Thank you. <laughs> That's a good question. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I think the foundation of all those new concepts um, is security um, to protect the identity. And this is what we have seen, for example, in the past with Second Life. Maybe s some people um, know it in the audience. They failed at the end because of the copy protection. So it was possible um, to hack characters and then to share content um, between other peoples um, without um, the, the rights to do so. And um, this is exactly where blockchain is for. So um, we will have all an identity, we have it already, right? Um, currently we have it on paper, we have it on the ID card. Um, we will have the same thing in the digital um, space. This will be secured by a wallet and with a digital key. And um, this digital key um, needs to be um, encrypted and needs to be secured. And this is all about that technology. It doesn't matter with that key or with that identity. You are exchanging pictures um, or content, um, um, create um, stuff, movies, or if you um, um, extend licenses, um, for example, there are companies already out. Um, they do this as a digital rights management um, to handle um, the licenses for their software, which is another great thing. And um, yeah, this, this, this will be the base um, fundamental functionality for the, for the metaverse as well, because if somebody gets hacked in the metaverse, then the system will collapse. The people will not use it anymore, because then it's not interesting anymore. I spend time to develop my own avatar, my own thing, maybe my own property, and if somebody can delete it, can change it, uh, can wipe it, then it, it makes no sense. And um, this is exactly where Web3 technology is, um, is there, and the key driver is the blockchain ecosystem. And yeah, it's, it's very interesting how it's moving. I still see it will take about maybe five um, to seven years um, to get further adopted. So currently everything looks like um, um, Roblox. So, um, <laughs> or Minecraft, um, if, if people it's remember called, that called game. It creative community. Yeah, <laughs> yeah actually, I want to, uh, th so this is um, a very nice transition into the topic of metaverse, because I am very interested, because, uh, uh, Michelle, we know that you are uh, leading the Blender community um, here, uh, and, uh, like, especially, like, uh, you know, in the, being in the 3D modeling space quite a lot. How, how do you see metaverse coming along with you and your community? Okay, from my position as a professor for animation, I should support Metaverse, but I'm, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm some kind of the hybrid generation. I know the old life. That means if the digital revolution will collapse, I can survive, yeah? <laughs> so no, just in case. No, um, I'm playing for over, since 2006, some kind of Metaverse game. Um, it's called, called EVE Online. Mm -hmm. And this is a really brilliant and immersive game. Um, and, this sh and I can tell you a lot about the up and down sides of such an experience. The p I, I mean, the metaverse is not maybe people think we are living in a virtual reality that is not really the metaverse. But if you create content for the metaverse where you want to bait people into the digital world, I mean, I have two sons at home. I know what it means when young people spend their time at school and at home only, uh, at the computer, they're living in some kind of metaverse with their community. The only good thing is they are telephoning all day long with their friends and not sitting isolated in a room like in the 90s. So um, <laughs> that's a positive thing. I see it more positive, not so negative, <laughs> but they need more movement outside. So um, the, the metaverse, problem is when I see it from, from my experience with the game I'm playing for over 16 years now, um, what is nice and I'm addicted to it of course, 
um, you have to, the day has 24 hours, and when you spend, let's say, 10 hours for work, then you have to spend some hours in the metaverse, yeah? Except you spend your work in the metaverse or whatever. And um, the, the technology develop, uh, development is always running its own speed besides the classic evolution, yeah? So the day has 24 hours and you, you could say, okay, the day has 24 hours and if this is not enough, we spend time in the metaverse, yeah? Something like this. So the problem will be maybe the time, the lifetime we have and we have to decide how do I spend my evening? Do I spend my evening with Eve online or with my family or with my friends? Yeah? And that, that is the, the most issue I have actually with the metaverse because the metaverse will force you to spend a lot of time and it's time consuming de depending on what you want to do with the metaverse. On the other side, the metaverse will connect people on a different way Correct. online. Let's Correct. say we, are, we have here this in the future, um, something like this, but you know from United States, but I can see you here with, let's say, my, my next generation of AR glasses, yeah? That, that will be, f in my opinion, the next step. Mm -hmm. And um, from my experience in the past, when I come out of the 80s with the first digital stuff, what I, I tell to my students, what I uh, experience today is sci-fi technology, yeah? And yeah. definitely we will experience in 20, 40 years, you will experience the same kind of unbelievable sci-fi technology. And if we think about the metaverse connecting people on a more immersive way, yeah, that you see you on the stage here, but you are not physically here, then it's a good thing. But if you spend your, your time in shooting spaceships, yeah, but communicating with people around the world, that is the positive side. But then you come to your question, is it really worth it? Yeah? That is my, my concerns about the metaverse. Yeah? I fully agree with you, and um, I think the reality will be somewhere in the middle. And um, there is a reason why it is called Web3. Um, I just think that in the next couple of years, we will just see um, the metaverse as an um, extension. So currently, if you browse on, on Amazon, for example, everything is 2D, right? And um, what the metaverse will give you as an additional feature is that you can walk around um, um, those goods, for example. Um, it, it, you don't necessarily need to wear um, the virtual hat glass. It's just an addition which will give you the even better experience. You can also walk around um, physical products, um, for example, if you want to purchase um, a new car. So um, today you go to the car dealer and the car dealer is showing you the car, but maybe you're asking a question, okay, I want to see it in a different color, Sorry, I don't have the color. But um, in, in the metaverse, um, for example, the customer can go in and he can um, visualize everything he want to see, different interior, exterior, um, maybe different tires um, and rims and, and all these kind of things. And I think this will be the next step because we can see already what um, Nike, for example, is doing. Um, they're doing this kind of um, shopping experience, fan engagement, um, where the people can go to their shops in 3D. It doesn't matter if it's in front of your computer or if you are wearing um, a headset because um, it was a very interesting discussion um, prior. I also believe as long as we have those big glasses, only a couple of nerds will really use it day by day. And um, we, we got the experience five years ago. Um, a lot of people tried it. There was this wow um, um, experience, but then, yeah, but wearing it all the time and um, I can see the grid, the resolution is not that good. Okay, let's wait another five years. Um, I think we are now at a stage where the, the VR glasses are becoming um, that way improved that um, we can run those applications, but they are still too heavy. Um, and same to the metaverse. I don't believe that we will end up in Ready Player One, um, where we have a second life. Um, it will be more um, advertisement, um, it will be education. Just think about um, school experience, university experience. Um, if you do physical experiments and you can walk around, if something explodes, it's not the classroom, it's just that environment. And um, 
I think that will be the next step. Yes, of course, I have also VR goggles at home, yeah, sure. <laughs> and my dream came true. I was watching Star Wars 1978 at the cinema, so we were talking for weeks about this movie, and I was talking some fake story to my uh, friends that there is a simulator in the United States where you can fly an X-wing and fight uh, the big Star Destroyers. It was, of course... Yeah, really, really? And now I was flying in the X-Wing and fighting Star Destroyers, yeah, in the virtual reality. Amazing. Of course, what you said is right, yeah? It, it was more from a gaming perspective point of view, a little bit too negative, maybe. Um, um, the metaverse will open all these opportunities, and the future is real time. We know it, yeah? And what you see now, what, of course, um, Mark Zuckerberg presented was like... Uh, that is a big fail in marketing, to be honest, uh, because this was gaming 20 years ago, something like this. But the future is real time for sure. Everything what I'm doing now, what takes, let's say, 10 minutes to render, will be f real time in 10 or 20 years. So, uh, and then the realism comes also into account for these applications. So this will be, of course, really exciting, but I warn, really, because I'm the perfect example. I know how much time I spent uh, into ask such my a wife. game. And then people <laughs> ask me, Michael, yeah, ask my wife. Or, uh, or my wife says, yeah, you are the reason why my kids are sitting at the computer and playing games. Yeah, Of course, I'm a digital... I'm coming from the pioneer times. And when I was with my mother at the shopping mall, there was Pac-Man. And I directly... Pac-Man was the initial... Motivation, this is what I want to do. Yeah, I didn't know what I want to do, but I was totally fascinated by the computer graphics on the CRT screen. Yeah. But if and I can jump in, I, yeah. I want to ask a question because also bring back to our philosophy of CRI. Because now listening to you, I can feel technology is ready to produce more and more content than ever, um, and also in a faster way, also for the metaverse. So I think uh, I understand that you are also very engaged, um, being also, the, as he said, um, um, I understand you are also leading the, the Blender community here. So do you feel, that's an open question, So because we were discussing, so how could we bring two, 2D, because CRI is right focusing on 2D, on what you do on the screen, mm -hmm. um, to protect the ownership and to have to create the, the proof of authorship here. So. Does it make sense also to bring it, as a, maybe over a question, to the 3D, to the 3D and make sure that all the content is decentralized way benefits also from the technology that is driven later, like security, like decentralization? This makes absolutely sense. Yeah. I'm, I mean, leading the Blender community is not really... I'm leading um, a Blender um, pay, um, group oh, on okay. Facebook with 72,000 people, mm -hmm. but most of them, of course, are not really active. But when I um, came, we are three administrators there, and of course, with my background as a creative and someone who went into an, its own, his own business at the end without all the knowledge and the pain by losing money because I also wasn't really aware how to negotiate with clients about the rights, mm -hmm. I tried to sensitize the Blender community. I, I changed the rules of this group, and we lost a lot of people, because of the rules, because they thought it's, it's a little bit bureaucratic. I want them, when they post their work, to give it a title, uh, the credits, yeah. a link to the source, yeah, that I can approve it. Of course, mo a lot of people don't do it, but I check it out, okay, that looks good. And often I do some research when I doubt it, that this is maybe from the, I try to find out who is the uh, own, uh, creator, and then I add the credits to it, mm -hmm. to, to bring, to, to sensitize the people here, uh, don't share just work from others, give it th this s stuff called freebooting is very common on so media. Yeah. We, my studio also did an animation uh, which has over one million clicks now on uh, Vimeo, but it was freebooted on the internet and they, these guys got more clicks than I got and no one mentioned that this was my work. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like time is a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, we are That's getting some. We are, we are getting some looks. <laughs> from, yeah. 
<laughs> I we will have more time. Yeah. <laughs> but but I, I heard that we have a question from the audience online, so maybe we can yeah, put this. Yeah, definitely. I, so you need a microphone, oh. of course. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, a question to Jörg is, where do you see the metaverse adding the most value? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a really good question. So um, again, I would say it's an um, extension to the um, existing Web 2.0. So that means everything becomes um, 3D, more virtual, and um, will give um, the end customer a better experience. Um, and um, I think, and this is what we can see in the industry already, it's in the first step more about advertisement, um, community aspect, people are coming together, um, talking to each other and all these kind of things um, and this will be continuously further developed. So I see it as an extension to the existing web. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I'd like to add a quick question just for the imagination of it. In the best case scenario, when do you think a CRI system will be possibly rolled out in a way that really every artist that uploads something to the web has their their property proven, basically. Well, it depends upon Joss, actually. <laughs> <laughs> go, Joss, go. Yeah. Go, no, go, but go. Uh, this is definitely our direction, what we are moving ahead towards. So we are starting in the 2D space, and we are getting very positive feedback from the beta testers that, uh, you know, this thing works. It's, it's really promising. And our goal is to now enable such technologies uh, also in the 3D space. And uh, we, as a company, definitely <laughs> Um, whose core audience lies uh, in the creative space are working towards it as soon as possible. Maybe one small comment and just also the complete picture. I think the power comes from community and partnerships. So we was welcome. We don't believe we can do this as a one company and one initiative with, with a strong technology background, yes, but I think it's important to have community users like Michelle is representing, but also partners like Jörg's um, or like um, software companies that produce provide software for creation. So I think that's really essential to make this running. So yeah. Very important point. Yeah. And this is why we call it an initiative, that we are a group of companies coming together to secure the rights of our users together. So it's really nice. Yeah. OK, I have to be rude. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> we could talk for hours. So thank you very, very much for this really inspiring and interesting and very deep dive into this topic this big parallel universe so thank you very life. much <laughs> thank you maybe i just want to add one last uh, point <laughs> So uh, we have set up a demo unit if you, if you want to experience how it works now. So um, I would be more than happy to show everyone how it works. And uh, yeah, we can definitely take it to um, the space there as well. Okay. Thank you again. Sorry. And cool. more yep. information. More about this you can so find via this QR yeah. code. So if you want to join the community, you want to share your thoughts, you yep. want to be a partner, yeah. just visit us on this website. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.
Hello and welcome back to Connected Inc. 2022 to our last session of the Technology Day here in the Wacom Experience Center in Düsseldorf. And the next session is about understanding the meaning of ink. And as in the session before, I think the panel uh, members can introduce themselves. Maybe it's the easiest way. So Heidi, you know how it goes. <laughs> Thank you very much. The stage is yours. <laughs> Experience Center and hello from Connected Inc. So the last session of today, and before I go there, actually I have to introduce myself, right? Silke, thank you for the reminder. Uh, my name is Heidi Heidi Wang. I'm in charge at Wacom uh, for the Inc. division, and the Inc. division is the department or um, organization managing, defining, building digital ink technologies in order also to create new use cases um, with pen and ink. And this actually brings me also to the topic of today, because that's a topic that um, I'm also very excited to, sh to share and moderate this with you, because I think that's a topic around AI technology that is not so visible. It's about uh, a success, uh, meaning of ink, because ink as a data today, it's graphics, so it doesn't have a meaning. So when you write something in digital space, it's graphical data, some nice lines, some drawings, um, and we at Wacom, we believe that when, when um, I discuss um, in, around building AI ink technology, said, well, the necessary step is to give ink actually the meaning so it can be processed equally in the digital space by algorithm, um, by services, in the same way as text, as audio, as, as, as media like um, pictures. And to get there, I realized, and uh, also that's why I'm having a partner here in this collaboration, we realized together that's a very complex challenge, actually, technically. And the, the, the theme is about data annotation. So when I started the collaboration, I was thinking, oh, how can it be that difficult? But then I realized building something from scratch, building a new data category in the digital space, it's a super complex technology challenge. That's why today I'm very excited actually to have Marcos here, working my team for AI technologies, and Thomas um, to share the challenges and to discuss and get also your feedback from the audience online on site um, about digital ink as data. So Marcos, do you want to start with the first introduction and then? So, um, as Heidi already introduced, I'm Marcus. I'm also called internally Dr. Ink, <laughs> um, because my role as a principal ink technologist is really to drive forward the technology development within Wacom. And uh, with my artificial intelligence background, I'm actually mostly like looking into how we can actually use AI to bring ink uh, forward and the, the whole technology stack around ink. So as, a, as she mentioned, like today we, we have one of our partners with us. He, um, he is here actually to, to support us also like with like bringing ink to, uh, meaning to the ink because and the first step is like having people supporting us to, uh, to say like what's the meaning of ink. So annotate the, the content before an AI can learn this. So uh, here is like Thomas and he can introduce himself. Yep, hello, my name is Thomas Fors. Uh, I'm the co-founder and uh, CEO of State Zero. Uh, my own background is uh, I started out as a software engineer, uh, then transitioned into a machine learning researcher, and then uh, moved into industry and uh, worked there for a few years, then decided to found the company State Zero, where I'm now. And uh, I've been within this field now for, I think, more than 12 years. So that's the intro. Thank you for coming, Thomas. <laughs> Good. To get this going, as I would like to ask Marcus actually to share a little bit um, also this situation and a little bit the context why we came up with this problem, actually making digital ink meaningful uh, for AI algorithm. So Marcus, do you want to give a short okay. intro on this? Yes. Actually, um, at the moment, Wacom is very much looking into education. Because actually there's where everything starts. Like I myself, I'm a father. I have my, my children now entering school and my daughter will also go to school next year. So I can actually see how they use pen and ink to, to, uh, to express themselves. And they are now learning how to use pen and ink and to, 
to go a bit further to to use like more um, expressiveness. So they learn how to write now and because they, they started actually with drawing. And if you look now at the, all the content that you see, how rich ink actually is. You, you can have like creative sketches, you can have like text, you can have artistic text, you have math. Math is also like a, a very creative domain and a, a creative way to express yourself. So having all this different uh, content, the very first thing that you need to do is like to, to put like the, the content in like uh, boxes. To, uh, to understand like what kind of ink uh, I'm faced with. Do I have some, some drawing? Do I have a diagram? Do I have like sketches, doodles? I have math or text? Because all of these ways are different ways to express themselves. And um, you have uh, creative text like poems in, in text. You have math. You have like very uh, uh, famous... Um, things that has been discovered by uh, mathematicians. So there's a lot of creativity, but in order to make whole, this whole content processable and have an AI support you in your, your processes, you first have to understand this. And like every content uh, is, needs to be analyzed in a different way. So the very first step that you have to do is you have to, to put them, as I said, into boxes. Differentiate between text, math, and diagrams, shapes, or, and so forth. And what we are now working on is like a technology that I called Ink Analyzer. So an analyzing the, the content first, to, as I said, like to, to figure out like what kind of ink do I have in the first place. Especially in education, in a math example, you always have like mixed content. It's never that you have like only uh, text, math, or uh, diagram. It's, it's always like very mixed. So with like a, a first step, we want to separate this so that we can do this further analysis. And one technology that is heavily used across industry for this is deep learning. Deep learning is like one of the, the trends in artificial intelligence over years now. It has been successfully applied on uh, image data, on text data, on audio, video. But is it ever really successfully applied on ink? Yes, there are some examples, handwriting recognition, math recognition, but still, the, the usage is very low because like, not a lot of people have like, yet uh, explored ink as an input. Yeah, so that's why we are trying to, to push this, and that's why we want to try to enable the community to, uh, to do more AI projects where they can use deep learning networks to, to do a lot of stuff. But what you need for this is annotated data, ground truth data, where like, a human is looking at the data and telling the machine in the first place, like, okay, this is text, that's the meaning of text, that's uh, drawing, that's the meaning of the drawing, because we have these capabilities. And we can share these capabilities by uh, assigning these annotations and give the machine the capabilities to learn this. So we need a teacher. And uh, doing this, there are several ways. Like one way is to do it manually with like a hand-made uh, annotations, like so you have to encircle like every uh, part of the, the ink strokes, assign its meaning to this. But this is a very tedious task and you need to train the annotators. So we are really looking into ways how besides these gold standard annotations, we can do this in a faster way. And that's actually where uh, when stage zero come in place, we are looking for partners in the market who, um, who can do this, who have experience with this. We didn't find them, but we found someone who is willing to try. And that's actually where uh, the, the collaboration kind of started. So, yeah. Yeah. so Thomas, can you share, because when I discussed the problem with Marcus and before meeting you actually, we were thinking, wow, that's a massive task. We, I could not even quantify it. If, I do, if we have to do everything manual, every document we collect, I'm manually doing the classification and doing these annotations. So can you share from your company and, and your technology background perspective? So how do, it's your best practice also as a service to help companies like us to overcome this challenge. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what, what we do as a company as well. Mm -hmm. so, so it's sort of better understood by the audience. So uh, Stage Zero uh, works in, in, in two fields, really. So conversational AI is one of them, and the other is uh, natural language processing. And uh, within, within these fields, our focus is mostly on, on data. So data sourcing, data annotation, right? Uh, 
within conversational AI, things we're working on are uh, like voice assistant, uh, speech recognition, and chatbots. And then within NLP, uh, we are working on things like, like together with Wacom on, on handwriting and understanding text in different way, ways, right? Uh, so companies kind of, when they are in, in, in the place where, where Wacom started out, they have really two only options to choose from. So one is uh, start building a team yourself that mm -hmm. handles the data. Uh, when you're talking about deep learning algorithms, what, what, what you really need or what you really need to end up with then is a team of hundreds of people looking at data in, in house. And that's, that's usually not something that the companies really want to start focusing on themselves because that's not their core, core business, right? So they want to focus on the core business and then the option there is to work with a partner in some way that can help them. And uh, that's where, where we come in because we, we're focusing on, on, on doing this in a scalable main, manner, right? Uh, the way we do this is uh, we integrate with different kinds of uh, partners, app partners in, in, in this case. So for example, with uh, games providers. Uh, and and uh, the, the games providers provide us with gamers that we uh, ask to perform small AI training tasks. Uh, and in, in, in reward for doing that, these uh, gamers then get in-game content or in-app content like a reward. So instead of having uh, an in-house team of hundreds or thousands of people, instead you have uh, gamers or app users globally that you access 24-7 uh, across the globe. And, and, and through that, you can then uh, get tasks really fast through and, 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 and get like a, a turnaround time that's fast. So is it something like crowd, activating the crowd to help you solving this task, right? Yeah, yeah, you can see this as uh, crowdsourcing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a term that's been used uh, quite, quite often in, in, in similar uh, situations. Mm -hmm. And actually, I, I also like know playing these small games there, there are always like ways to, to where you want to get some coins, some internal uh, currency to, uh, to actually buy some extra stuff and so forth. And uh, most of the times you have to, to watch a video or do some, fill out some from forum or uh, take part in a survey. But here it's actually, you're doing something good. You're, mm -hmm. you're helping to, to annotate data and you do something senseful. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's not meaningful. It's not... Uh, uh, watching a stupid uh, advertisement, so. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. It's one of the things that made me excited about this idea in the beginning was uh, just uh, using gamers uh, and players across the globe for something good. That That's something that, like, gamers have gotten a bad rep over the years. Of course, the image has gone better and now everyone is a gamer, but people used to uh, not like people playing games, but now we have, like, an approach on how to, how to turn that into uh, something that's useful for society. Yeah. yeah, I have to admit, as person, as consumer, I played games, and I, only knowing you, um, having this discussion, I was like, oh, now actually I was contributing actually by playing this game, having fun, killing my time, and then, but at the end, I contributed actually to um, data accuracy to improve the data um, source by annotations. That's interesting. Um, maybe a question because I, when I, Marcus and I discussed the, the topic, let's make ink meaningful. So your first reaction, I think that's a very big, very different challenge probably also um, with the project you are running usually. Yeah, yeah. So uh, ink is definitely different from, from images and, and, and from text. So I, I guess that there's many different dimensions to look at it from like from, from a computer perspective, uh, like file formats are different, how you store it, uh, how they are represented. Like on a technical level, I guess, uh, an image is represented like uh, many pixels, and each pixels has has like a value of uh, color value, and then uh, a text, for example, is is like a string of characters or like a group of characters together that then become meaning. Uh, but if you look at uh, digital ink, then it's sort of an added dim dimension to it to, to text, uh, like. Not not only is it characters, but it's also like every every stroke you draw is is recorded. So so there's like a sequence of how how in what sequence do you draw these characters? So it becomes a word. Uh, what's the sort of pressure you use? Uh, that's recorded as well. And uh, yeah, th there's many dimensions to it that that doesn't exist into in normal text. That then makes it 
uh, a much more complex problem and, and, and something that, yeah, we're trying to help solve. Yeah. Yeah. But listening to the richness of data, Marcus, do you want to maybe share the discussion we have about data privacy and how to approach this? Because I guess also, yeah. especially in education, that's a big, big, big topic. Oh yeah, that's a <laughs> long and painful story that I yeah. could share. I could go on like a whole session like talking about the data privacy aspect. But on the other side, it's, it's a very important aspect. Because uh, in the end, we, we don't want to do something bad with the data. We really uh, want to contribute to society. We want to help uh, teachers. We want to help uh, students in education. We, we don't want to make sure that the data is not misused like for, for, for classifying bad students and good students, or like uh, identifying students with like a certain limitations and stuff like that. It's, it's more about like helping them on their, uh, in their daily workflows. And for this, and also for if you are collecting data, it's very important that you also have like, you have transparency, you have a consent, so it's not that you are secretly uh, capturing the data, like uh, stealing the data from applications. No, you really have to be transparent, so like, hey, we are using your data, that's the purpose we are using it for, that's the kind of data we are collecting, we have a reason for collecting, for instance, like metadata on the person, and in the end, we really focus on the content. We don't want to have any personal data, that's why we put like several uh, flows in place, so we have uh, a user consent, as mentioned, we have also like a review of the content that has been uh, uh, collected to make sure that like a student was not writing his name by accident because really we don't care about the name we just want to make sure that we have the content that we can train our AI on content and not on the personal data and then in the end when we have collected the data we t cut the ties to the the person so we we are not interested about the identity in this case we really focus on the content to train our AI to work with content and not with personal data and we also have no business model related into uh, like categorizing uh, people and share them some ads and uh, sell them stuff. It's really to, to help people in education to improve workflows, to uh, have a better learning experience, to share with uh, teachers more insights that they are losing because of uh, remote situations. So it's really that we try to be transparent what we are doing with the data. Yeah, so it's a lot of the commitment really to set up this framework in the um, also in terms of transparency um, to the user. Um, I was actually thinking when you explained how, um, how you can really use, utilize the crowd and the community to help you uh, solving the uh, annotation task, which is then being parallelized, and also you, I understand you also cut it down in micro task. So I think definitely it's an upgrade in the, in the scalability and it, um, um, speed. Um, of um, data notation, but I wonder because by logical I would say okay, why don't AI technology also contributes to this task? Because right now it's still very manual. So can you share a little bit maybe from the industry expert? Is there any um, trending technology coming up also using AI to solve this task? Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, within the digital uh, ink space or handwriting space, I guess there isn't yet that many. Uh, technologies like that, but if you look at, uh, for example, what's been done within, within the text, uh, text field, uh, I think something like, like that will be upcoming and, and maybe something that, that we will be working on at, at some point. Uh, so within, within the text uh, segment, there's been developed like these large language models. You might have heard of like GPT-3 and other things that are sort of underlying models to, to understand how people use language either in text or in speech. Uh, and, and, and something similar like, like that, that could be built uh, within Digital Ink. Uh, what would be needed then is, of course, you have a, a large set of uh, handwritten notes that you're sort of training the, mm -hmm. training the algorithms first on so that it understands like how, how are people writing, how are people using this. And then on top of that, you can start using uh, other methods uh, like you asked, like how, how could technologies be built upon that? Well, you would train then on top of that uh, with a smaller sample set, something, for example, to recognize math or, or something else and, and, and use that to um, then start predicting different types of labels and then, then you only need to really use uh, people to verify those labels instead of uh, actually doing all the whole manual thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
there are also some uh, other domains who are successfully looked into um, technologies like data augmentation, meaning like producing some synthetic data on some already existing database. So you can train an AI to, to produce handwriting. There is some work done on this. Uh, you can use like existing layouts to, to create like uh, new documents with uh, like just like existing um, databases that you have like content from this. Like, I call it like ransom notes. You remember like there are all these movies where you have like these ransom notes, someone like cutting from different magazines like words and putting them on a, a, cheese, a sheet of paper. You can do the same with ink and then produce like more content based on an initial data set that you have. Or there are other uh, trends like annotation-free training, where you use, for instance, such an artificial data set to train your initial model and then um, actually label some unseen content uh, with like pseudo labels and if they are like confident, uh, if the, the network is confident with these labels, you use them again to train your system so that it improves itself. But the, the interesting part is you still need some crown truth data, like an initial data set that is labeled. And that's the, the, the part that we really want to solve. We, we want to get like this first barrier, like having the, the first data set to, to start to work on like more stuff and then train AI systems. And for, for this, we need a community. We need like more people looking into this. We need like more developers saying like, yeah, I, I really want to explore like a new space, like be a visionary in, uh, in the ink domain. So, and that's why we, we also try to, to open up our services to, to the community. We really want to uh, jointly work on some services to, for instance, like share some uh, initial data sets so you can license data to start from the, uh, the beginning so that it's not as, you don't have like this high barrier or uh, for, for enterprises have really targeted data collections because that's what we are also now experiencing. It, you can say like, okay, I, I train a system for for like uh, for education, that's cool. But then it's like, yeah, which country? And then the, the, because there is even like in math, there's differences between the, the different cultures and countries. And then there are like uh, students in the lower age might have like different handwriting than the ones in the high, uh, high school and in university. And then if you have a doctor level or a doctor degree, your uh, PhD, your handwriting gets even messier. Think about your, uh, your doctor's uh, <laughs> in medicine. So it's like there's, Every target group has like a different handwriting, so sometimes you need to have like really targeted data sets. And here we also want to, to help to make it easier, provide the tooling, because there is no good tooling outside. We, we looked at it, we looked for this, that's why we started everything from the scratch. We had the universal ink model, we tried to standardize uh, with content schemas where we de define like the results from handwriting recognition, from sketch recognition and so forth. And um, we are building all the tooling because, and now we want to share this with the community because then you don't also have to start from the scratch. Mm -hmm. So it's maybe a question to you, Thomas. Um, now working together on this one project, so what's also your expectation to um, further scale up uh, the adoption of ink, right, annotation technologies that we're building together? Mm, expectations, uh, I, gu I guess, we need uh, just more data, so uh, getting more data from the community, uh, different actors to join in, uh, partner and help uh, help build up databases of, of uh, content that can be then labeled and um, yeah used. Maybe uh, what I would like to see is sort of uh, maybe even like open source data sets built so, so that different participants can join without uh, investing a lot in the beginning, and then when they know what they wanna wanna do with it, then then they can start investing more and uh, just experiment for free in the beginning, basically. Yeah, actually, uh, a good statement on this there, especially the uh, the the computer graphics um, and uh, the community in this domain. They started uh, a similar initiative, the the ImageNet, which has like millions of. Uh, um, annotated image data sets like on the web and which are available for for research and i can see at some point like uh, something similar an inknet we also have like from all the different societies communities from research contributing to build a, such uh, such a big uh, yeah public data set uh, an open data set where where people can actually contribute their um, 
their data collections and put everything open, available for, for other researchers to, to work on this. Because then if we have like such an open community and such an exchange, we can actually do much more and much better technologies for, for ink than has ever been seen. Yeah, this I want to. I was actually thinking about when um, when I talked to you right later earlier today, um, the image, the image um, recognition that today where it is just from you are able actually just to enter keywords right, and you can find you can search for the right images even I think up to sentiments. Yeah. I think that's a very good analogy um, why this community driven and also developer um, centric um, approach is very very important. Yeah, yeah, and I, I agree, and uh, I think the AI community in general has been really good at that uh, so far, so I, I think it can also extend to Inc. It, it, it's just a matter of, of getting it started. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Then I would say um, I want to take maybe any questions, because I, I really, again, I think this learning from you guys is really um, Something you don't see so often, because when you talk about AI technology, you talk about the AI powers, the outcome of the algorithm, but actually it starts very hands-on. It starts building this, as you said, the data that is delivering the ground truth, and it's all about training, feeding data, how to get more data, even controversial data, right, to make the algorithm stronger and stronger. So I think it's a, it's a thank you also for sharing this. Um, because I think it's not so, you don't see this so common that people really share um, what's the background of actually a good AI um, algorithm. So so thank you. Before and we start in Q&A, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any questions from the audience? Oh, oh. the hand, hands are rising. <laughs> uh, but I need one microphone, please. Oh. Thank you, thank you. So uh, Avinav, what's the first one? <laughs> I'm the closest. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I mean, it's it's very powerful to have all of this annotated data, and people can then do so much with ink. Um, I think, from a product vision point of view, how do we plan to make this available to uh, more developers, and uh, how do we want them to use this um, ink technology with the data set? Okay. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, I already told like we are, we are currently working on um, like to to start the the whole process and uh, the first thing that we we need is like for for like certain domains like certain problems we we are collecting the data that's like always the the first part and on the long run we need obviously like more data sources and also like a community who is willing to share data that's like the the, the very in, uh, initial problem and uh, in the end we we need then at some point to have a platform where we can share this data. So it will be uh, hopefully, as I said, like at some point a community effort, because I know, uh, especially in research, a lot of um, initiatives started around this, and we need to engage with research, uh, research. And I already did this with some communities. I, I got in touch with them. We are visiting some uh, communities that are focused around handwriting recognition, document analysis, stuff like this. And we need to get engaged with them because like a lot of researchers are, they also need data and data, data, data is everything that you hear from, from uh, data scientists, from machine learning engineers and researchers. So somehow uh, building the technology stack and offering tools and at some point a platform where they can contribute the data, that's something that um, we are planning to do over time, but this needs time. And also like the, the, the support from, from legal side to make it also compliant because that's sharing data is also like a very crucial part. So we need to build up the framework. We have to have the transparency and the platform. And we are currently building all the, the blocks for this. And in the end, hopefully in, in a few years, I can actually start the, the ink net. <laughs> <laughs> well, but one comment about this, I think our product vision is really be specific. So we start with collecting data from really specific domains, yeah. from specific applications, really to also to boost up the quality. Because I think only relevant data is helping. And then by this, I think it will grow over time um, to more and more use case. I think that's an important approach that we have decided. The second yeah. one was Oliver. I can. Hold it right. <laughs> um, my question is about, yes, you said at the beginning, security is the most important part, and I agree fully, because ink is so individual. If we are able to train a machine on learning how to draw from a specific person, this machine might be able to draw, like write 
if it actually learns all the, the specific parts. So I would be interested how, if you want to share and make it open source, how are you making sure that people will not like misuse the way of collecting by siphoning off, by like adding one fork into your open source fork and making one which is like the black ops version where you just siphon off the data that you actually need to make your little um, yeah, kind of special AI just for this person. That's my question. That's a very good question. <laughs> that's actually, there, uh, especially that's why it's uh, so important that uh, we have the transparency. So, like, okay, that's what uh, uh, if you contribute your data, it's used for this AI research, and it's used for a specific tasks like uh, uh, training handwriting recognition, training math recognition, training sketch recognition. And you know, like there, they, there is this uh, research in the in the image uh, space where like artist work is used actually to generate new new artwork, and that's that's a really critical from a certain kind of view. So I agree, but on the other side, this kind of work can also be used to to inspire people. So it's it's the the, the hard part is really like there's always like this dual use. And that's really hard to prevent. So uh, uh, it's very important to have somehow like these um, ethics in AI to, to make sure like, like technology that is built on, on top of such data is not misused. So it's, I think there is no uh, real solution to this because as I said, like dual use is always a problem. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm just gonna um, mention like the, the text text sort of segment where they've been doing these things before, they, they are not usually sharing the underlying data at all. Like what they are sharing are pre-trained models. So, so for those, they have already sort of transformed the underlying data so you can no longer uh, extract mm -hmm. it out of it. Yeah. So something similar to that could be done, I think. Yep. Next question. Yes. Uh, I have one question to you, Thomas, um, about this uh, crowd approach and annotation. When I got you right, it's about the annotation mainly, or in the case you're working with Wacom, is there also a chance to get data in a crowd approach? Yeah, so uh, it, it depends on the use case. Uh, but yes, we, we can also collect data. Uh, we haven't or we, we have collected some data for, for uh, handwriting before, uh, but uh, using this crowdsource approach, we have mainly collected speech, uh, speech data so far. Uh, the main issue there is like uh, we need to have, if we want to have someone with a, a tablet, then they need to have the tablet in the crowd, right? Uh, what we could easily collect, for example, is, is people writing with fingers on mobile phones. Mm -hmm. That, that, that's not an issue. That, that, that's something if, if that would be needed, that could could be done. Uh, but I think we can have like innovative ways to to get get a crowd for that as well. There, there is also like a very uh, famous example from the community. There, there was like one time uh, an experiment by Google that was called Quick Draw, and there the idea was that uh, you were asked to to doodle something like uh, doodle a house or like. Uh, uh, a lion or something like this, or uh, a tree. And then the, the AI tried to guess what you are drawing while, uh, while drawing. So it, it was constantly like guessing, oh, are you drawing a house? Are you drawing a lion? Are you drawing this? So they kind of like had a gamification approach to somehow like have a lot of people like draw data in this uh, application. And at some point they had like so much data that they had like a really good uh, algorithm in the end to actually really predict like from doodles like what people are drawing. So it was a, a fun way. I also like contributed like quite some data because I found it kind of like funny <laughs> to, to use it. And I think even like when they released it, they, they said for some time the server was going down because like it was a, it went viral and people were like uh, contributing data like hell. So a lot of people are willing to, to do things like this if it's like done in a fun way. So gamification is also a good approach. Yeah, I think Jos has a question. Come to you. Yes, so related to the question of data, um, there's a large corpus of like handwritten data, actual sort of physical documents available. And I'm, I was wondering whether, 
from a technology point of view, are we aiming to sort of bring those documents into the flow and how you think that a handwritten document versus a document that starts in digital link, whether that's going to impact the research and the way that the data actually works? Uh, again, to which kind of data you're referring to? Uh, like handwritten image so scanned documents, basically. Scanned yeah. documents, yeah. So I scanned handwritten documents. Yep, there, there is a bit of a difference uh, in the, the scanned documents because it's like raster graphics. So you're missing like the, the, the whole flow. And um, that's something completely different. It's a, it's a different domain when you look at it from an AI perspective. You have like static data versus the dynamic data. There are some, some networks trying to automatically extract from an image the, the sequences trained uh, also like on sequential data and but it's still not as good as like the, the the handwritten data and we are really focusing on on data that is coming from like stylus input so for maybe for for some tasks like uh, layout analysis or um, like uh, um, some some hand -driving, you might be able to to leverage like scanned images as well but for scanned images you also have like the the, the same challenge you need ground truth annotation and that's uh that's again like one of the challenges that we are trying to to solve with like these micro tests thank you are there any questions from the online audience no but um, i will come to you I have a question about um, the data analyzing, so handwriting recognition, etc. cetera. Um, what role or how um, important is which hardware used uh, once you create this da the data? So um, maybe you can draw on your phone with a finger or maybe with a um, pen or maybe Wacom device, etc. cetera. So how, how relevant is this for the data and tra tracking this? Oh, thank you. Uh -huh. Now the favorite answer of every machine learning engineer, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it depends on the, the, the use case. What are you trying to do? Mm -hmm. For instance, for, for handwriting recognition, finger uh, input might be fine. Also like the different kind of styli might be fine. But if you are more into biometric and has like signature verification, you need better quality in, in, your, um, in your collection, the uh, capturing device. And you need like good sensor technology. And uh, for, in general, like deep learning uh, scientists try to, to normalize data in a way. So you try to, to figure out like what's the, the minimum uh, yeah, nominator. So if you, for instance, like have just like XY coordinates, you just use the XY coordinates. If you also have like pressure, pen orientation, you might want to use also like this kind of, uh, of data. And then obviously it's good to, to have somehow like homogeneous data, that's like the best case but that's something that you almost never uh, get. So that's why you try to, to solve this in deep learning, like having a ton, uh, a lot of data, like millions of uh, doc, um, pen samples from, from this hardware, from this hardware, from uh, fingers and stuff. At some point, uh, the, the network is capable of uh, abstracting this and ignoring like the, the, the specifics. But if you have like very little data, it's obviously good if you have like a homogeneous, so. Maybe you can also like comment on this. Um, yeah, yeah. So in in, in general, uh, when uh, when you have a little data, the the higher quality it has to be, and and the more exact it has to be, and uh, th that's why deep learning has been so good in general because you can uh, start ignoring errors and and uh, by by just having more data. Uh, so there's, there's research that shows that sort of doubling, doubling the amount of data that you have is aching to removing a few percentage of uh, noise in the data. So, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Maybe a short addition to this as well oh. is like, the, depending on other domains, like sometimes because people are contributing a lot of data unwillingly, like in uh, the case of like Amazon, Alexa, not mention it further but uh, <laughs> if you have like these kind of things you, you have like tons of data so you can apply this but if you really uh, try to be cautious with the data collection transparent and so forth then uh, you you don't have like from the beginning like a lot of data and that's the the challenging part for us because we we don't do like this uh, grabbing like all the data that we can get our hands on we want to have transparency we want to have user consent and that's why for us it's also like uh, more challenging to, to, to get like sufficient number of data. 
Thank you. Some more questions? Online? Oh, that's right. So I have uh, hopefully a very simple question. Um, how long do you believe it will take for hand script recognition, uh, math recognition, sketch uh, recognition to reach a level of perfection, a reliable level of perfection? That's actually a very simple question. It depends on the people <laughs> like, who are listening now, who hopefully say like, <laughs> okay, I want to change this, I want to bring this to perfection, I want to contribute data, I'm willing to share my data, because the, the more data you, we can collect with like consent, and the easier it will get to get these uh, networks to perfection. Because uh, if you compare, for instance, like um, uh, speech recognition, it's uh, someone, like, five years back uh, in the past, and now if you have like uh, Siri, Alexa, then it's, it's, it's getting really good. It's, it's, uh, it's almost like, even like they understand my kids, my kids are using an Alexa for, uh, for actually playing their, their, their music, some uh, audio books and stuff, and they, they understand my kids. So uh, the, the system is getting better because like there was a lot of data being contributed. And uh, if you have like more people using uh, ink, in their applications. And if we build such an ink net as a, a shared community, then at some point the, the networks will come to perfection. Because that's the cool thing about deep learning, it scales with the masses of data that you have. So it's all about the data. Yeah. Yes. The acceleration really comes from real users, right? Yes. Because yeah. when our well, speech recognition started, it was a very limited use case, right? In very specific domain. And when the smart home really um, start to expand as a product, Productization platform. I think this was the accelerator. That's another question. I keep it. As you just um, uh, mentioned, Amazon Alexa um, for speech recognition. So, what is the Amazon Alexa for ink recognition then? So, what is the problem that you're actually trying to solve? That's also like a very good question. Right. For for instance, like one uh, easy uh, problem is like handwriting recognition perfectly recognize the, the handwriting. Because if you recognize the, the, the handwriting, you can digitize the text and then you can further work with the text. You can assist students during their homework. You can uh, propose them additional valuable content for, for the problems that they're solving. Or if you think about professional note takers, you can have them, uh, like while they're, they're writing their, their meeting minutes, you can propose them some uh, valuable information. Like for instance, you're uh, someone in working in finance, you can crawl like, uh, like the, the latest financial news and bring up some, some nice articles that are relevant for, for his context. And uh, if you think about math recognition, you write down a math formula, you got stuck, you are hesitating, and then the AI can understand what you're uh, writing the formula and give you some hints. Like say like, oh, do you want to have a, a, a plot for this function? Or can I propose you the next step uh, to, to solve the, the, the system of equations? So like supporting students in their daily work or a teacher is writing something on, on the whiteboard, a, a student asks a question, you recognize what he is writing and then he can, oh, wait, let me produce a plot for you or let me draw some, some more uh, information from, from our uh, school cloud and so forth. Or like for um, uh, someone who's taking like a lot of notes and they, you want to automatically summarize like the meeting for this, you first need to digitize the, the content, and then uh, you can do like an automatic summary. These are all techniques that are applied on text, or if you write like a date, you can just tap on the date and create a calendar entry. But in order to, to do these kind of things, support students, uh, 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 knowledge workers in their processes, you first need to recognize the content. And that's actually the, the problem that we're trying to solve. Make ink more actionable. You can, that you can really work with your ink. Like if you're typing a, a smartphone message, everything is automatically recognized. You can see like typing a date, click, uh, create an entry. And I want to do the same with ink. I think this is the perfect last word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 so we run out of time. Thank you. So I have to close the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Heidi, do you have any last words? <laughs> thank you for coming, and thank you also to speakers. Um, 
here um, to really share your stories and your um, um, technologies and your um, cases. So I appreciate that very much. And we have two more days to go. Yes. So stay tuned. So one day about education and also we will touch base also on the topic of handwriting relevance to connect to your question. And last will be our creativity where we also further explore what kind of workflows um, can be further enhanced in terms of um, technology and new use cases also in creation. Which so thank you also for coming. Yeah, thank you very much. And looking forward to have more networking. Yeah. We will return online on Saturday at 12 p.m. a.m. noon. <laughs> noon. <laughs> yeah, at 12. Um, so thank you very much for coming, for watching online. And here in Düsseldorf, we will have some drinks and snacks and nice chats. And uh, see you, hopefully, the day after tomorrow. Have Great. a nice evening. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.